Can I get a confirmation um, that eScribe and Zoom are ready to go? Uh, let's wait a minute on eScribe. I uh, just want to make sure that she's in the meeting. So give me a couple minutes. Okay, Jordan, we're good to go. Hey, Jordan, we're good now. Okay, we'll get started in just a moment. Um, just uh, for um, committee staff, just checking uh, checking in on status of Zoom and eScribe and making sure that we're ready to go. Can you hear me, Jordan? Jordan, are you able to hear staff? I'm sorry, can someone, I, I, I had my speakers muted on my end, so I think I didn't hear the responses to my first question. Can someone um, just uh, check in with me and make sure that, can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. I can hear you. And okay. we're all good here, Jordan. Okay, great. I just had my, um, my speaker muted, so I wasn't hearing anything coming back in. So <laughs> my apologies. Okay, we will go ahead and get started then. Um, so um, uh, thanks everyone for bearing with me for a little bit of a slow start here. Um, we will um, call, I will call the Land Use and Planning Committee for August 19th to order. Um, this is um, the first of two Land Use and Planning uh, Committee meetings today. Um, and we'll go from, uh, from now until about 11.20. Um, and our first item, as always, is roll call. Um, I'm going to call out people that I see on the screen, and I'll note others as they arrive. Um, so I, I see Becerra. Uh, Anderson is absent. Becerra is present. Contos is absent. Harp is absent. Hess is present. Jones is present. Merritt is present. Ramos is absent. Cheryl is present. Uh, Vasika is present, von Losberg is present, and West is absent. Um, so we've got we've got seven, which is a quorum, um, and I anticipate that um, folks will be filtering in um, momentarily here. Um, we have no minutes to approve, so um, with that, um, I'm going to move on to to public comment that is not on the agenda. Um, and um, so if you have public comment on the 2920 Expo Parkway rezone, we're going to hold that until later in the meeting. Um, but anyone who um, has has a comment uh, on a non agenda item, uh, you're welcome to um, raise your hand within the zoom webinar. Um, and I will um, monitor that and um, and recognize anyone. Um, 
you can do that um, via a computer or laptop. Uh, you can also do that um, via the, the iPhone or Android apps. If you're calling in on a telephone, it looks like we have one person doing that. Um, you can press star nine um, to raise your hand and that will, um, that will indicate to me that you'd like to give comment. Um, we also have some public comment alternatives um, leading into the public hearing on this item. Um, that is um, uh, our Engage Missoula website, engagemissoula.com, and look for the private uh, or the developer initiated projects link on there. Um, we also have a council voicemail box, which is 552 6012. Um, and those will all um, get into the record on this project as well. So um, with that, we have three hours for this item um, for the, the 2920 Expo Parkway rezone. Um, I think that'll go very quickly. Um, I want to give a little preview. Um, so today is a pre-public hearing, so this is informational only. Um, we will not be expressing um, opinions on the project until after the um, until after the public hearing, um, and um, after our information gathering um, phase uh, through through that public hearing. Um, now is a, a perfect time to ask uh, questions, um, clarifying questions of the applicant or of, of staff, um, or any kind of questions about the impact of this process, uh, this, pro this proposed rezone. Um, so um, I encourage you to be um, uh, far ranging in your questions and just try to get anything out there that, that, that uh, could impact uh, your decision on this, on this uh, rezone. Um, structure today, we have Dave Grand Prix here from Development Services. He'll be giving the staff report. Um, and then um, since we are um, meeting virtually and since this is a, a large, um, a large proposed um, rezone, um, we're, we're going to be providing an opportunity for the applicant to give a, a presentation. Um, and that'll be for um, the applicant will have 30 minutes to, to make their presentation. Um, and then we're providing um, the Friends of Grant Creek and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation an opportunity to provide uh, presentations as well. Um, and um, f following that, we'll do a mix of public comment and, um, and committee questions. So um, with that, uh, I'll note for the record that um, Heather Harp has joined us, and then um, I'll turn it over to Dave for our staff report. All right, good morning, counselors. I'm Dave DeGrampe with Development Services, the lead planner on the project for the city of Missoula. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start a PowerPoint presentation for you. Uh, to provide a little bit of background. And as we go, I encourage you to uh, interrupt me, ask questions, uh, whatever you, whatever's, uh, whatever would help you. I know there's a, a lot of interest in this and a lot to know. So please feel free. So the application in front of you is, has been submitted by KJA Developments here of Missoula. Uh, the applicant is Mike Morgan of Hoffman Morgan Associates. And the proposal is to rezone property located at 2920 Expo Parkway. Currently there are four zoning designations on the property. Uh, they are R5.4 residential, RM135 multi-dwelling, B2-2 community business, and C1-4 neighborhood commercial. And the applicant has requested to rezone the entire property to RM145 multi-dwelling residential. If you're familiar with the property itself, it's uh, uh, located um, just west of Grand Creek Road. It's accessed from Expo Parkway and also Stonebridge Road. There are two parcels, uh, 44 acres total in size. The property, uh, the west part of the property, you, you can see um, that there's an irrigation ditch. It kind of it runs along the northern boundary then cuts roughly southwest across the property. Above the irrigation ditch is steep hillside, um, grassland, and below the irrigation ditch, uh, the property has been used historically as a gravel pit. Surrounding land uses, I mentioned the hillside on the west. Um, to the north, there's a, a single, single dwelling type residential subdivision. To the east is the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation headquarters. There's a, a warehouse visitor center and visitor center there to the east are the multi-dwelling, it's a condominium type subdivision, cottonwood condominiums. And to the south, I'm sure you're familiar, there's the Cracker Barrel restaurants, there are uh, three hotels and a couple of other larger lots that are, are poised for uh, auto-oriented commercial type development. 
Uh, this gets a little a little convoluted and a little interesting, I suppose. You know, the, like I mentioned earlier, uh, there are four different zoning districts that actually are on the property. So the property is what's called split zoned. Uh, there are some residential designations and some commercial designations. And the way this works is under uh, under Missoula's Title 20, uh, when a property has more than one zoning applied to it, uh, when a developer comes in with an application, essentially the more restrictive zoning is applied. So for example, on the northern property, you can see that there's an R5.4, so that's residential. Typically, it's a single family type residential um, zoning district. There's RM135, again, that's multifamily, and there's also a commercial zoning district, C1-4. So three zoning districts are on the property right now, and if a developer wanted to come in according to and do a development project, according to Title 20, the R5.4 would apply because that's the most restrictive. Again, it's single family. Uh, I'd like to do just a quick comparison um, to, you know, I know zoning can be, can be kind of complex, uh, lots of acronyms and, and initials and numbers and things like that. So I wanted to kind of give you a sense of the different types of, of uses that could be allowed on, on these properties. Oh, let me just go back. And so um, back to the, the split zoning. So on, this, on the northern parcel, I mentioned that the zoning that we would apply is R5.4. On the southern parcel, the more restrictive zoning is the RM135. So those, these are two independent parcels that could be developed independently, although they're under the same ownership. But those are the two uh, zoning districts that we would apply. So with the comparison, this, this table shows you the, the types of uh, minimum lot sizes, minimum area per unit, um, maximum heights and things like that, that would be applied to the property today. Probably the most important element of this table is, is the last row. Um, after, after it's all said and done, you know, after we've looked at the parcel sizes and, and all the uh, parameters or requirements of the zoning, what it boils down to is, as it stands today, the north parcel could be developed with roughly 155 single dwelling units, and the south parcel could be developed with roughly 339 dwelling units. So it's just under 500, uh, 494 dwelling units could be built on it today. Although that doesn't take into account things like area for roads, um, activity area for apartments, setbacks and things like that. So that's kind of a ballpark number to keep in the back of your mind. I'm not telling you that there could be 494 exactly units on it, but it gives you a, a sense of scale. And the developer is requesting to, um, to apply RM145 to the property. And so this is a, the parameters for the RM145 are, are basically the exact same as RM135. The only difference is the, the height. So in RM135, which applies to the southern parcel today, you can have buildings up to 35 feet high. In RM145, you can have them to 45 feet high. So again, this goes through uh, you know, the parameters for, for development. Um, and then the most important line again here is the bottom, the, the bottom row. Um, so after it's all said and done, up to 1,185 units could be built on the property if the entirety of it is rezoned. However, again, this figure uh, is just a kind of a ballpark figure. It doesn't take into account parking, circulation, area for landscaping, activity area, setbacks, et cetera. So it's, it's certainly an elevated number. It's higher than, than, I don't mean to be alarmist, you know, it's higher than what could be built there today, but it kind of, again, gives you just a sense of scale. So what, what we're looking at is roughly uh, doubling the development capacity of the parcel um, if the zone change goes through to RM145 from what could be developed there today. Uh, this is to me one of the most important kind of pieces in this puzzle and it's the, it's the map from the growth policy. And so the growth policy um, actually applies two different land use designations, two different recommendations uh, to this parcel or to this property, I guess. Uh, there's residential high, and so that's a designation that is encouraging. It's basically designating this area for, for multifamily, for apartments. And the residential high designation, um, it allows up to, I think it's 43 dwelling units per acre. It's 24 to 43 dwelling units per acre. So when you went through the growth policy process back 2013 through 2015, and a future land use map was developed, you know, this is, this is public policy right here. Uh, this is kind of the culmination of all the values, the goals, the policies, 
that are put forward in the growth policy and it's applied you know visually or, or geographically graphically onto a map and so um, the parcels 44 acres in size or the two parcels are 44 acres in size about 87 percent of the property are designated as residential high the other designation in pink is regional commercial and services and so this is an area um, that's set up for larger scale type commercial development um, it's designating the area as is appropriate for things like you know hotels uh, larger restaurants could this designation can encompass a whole lot of different um, different land uses and different zoning districts. It's basically larger scale commercial, you know, it's things like um, th things that require a lot of space. So for example, maybe a car dealer or warehouses or things like that. Any number of commercial uses would be appropriate according to this land use map on the, uh, on the Southern area, in the pink area. And that's, that's uh, I think it's about 8% of the property itself. No, 13%, I'm sorry, 13%. Uh, in terms of the growth policy implementing districts, so when you have a, a map that I just showed you, uh, uh, can I stop you here for a couple for a question? Um, Please. First of all, um, I note for the record that Heidi West is here, and then um, Amber Cheryl has a question. Yeah, thanks. I just need a little clarification. If you go back to slide um, five and six, well, really six, slide six. I think that was right. I thought it said six at the bottom. No, the, the keep going. <laughs> yeah, this. Okay, so on the, um, okay, so after the hill hillside density reduction on the north and the south parcel, we have the 155 and the 339. So in slide six, I just want to be sure I have my numbers right. Um, with the requested, there you go, thanks. Um, the, um, that's for the, the north and south together, right? Because we would zone them together. The 1185 would be the combination. That's correct. Okay. I, I just wanted to make sure of that. Thank you. Yeah. But again, I just want to stress that that's probably not realistic. That's probably a higher number than could actually be built on the property due to requirements for roads, for parking, for landscaping, all those other things. Right. Okay. Thank you. I see that my numbering is wrong. This says four down at the bottom. Confuse me, sorry about that. Uh, so with these growth policy designations, you know, these are general land use designations and each of these designations then is accompanied by um, a, an implementing district. So the way it starts is the growth policy provides general recommendations, general categories for land use and building types. And then it recommends uh, specific zoning districts that could be used to help achieve those uh, or implement those those recommending districts. So for the residential high density uh, land use designation in your growth policy, there are four different implementing districts. There's the RM135 multi-residential, RM145 residential multi-dwelling, RM1.5 and RM0.5. So they're all multi-family as you can see residential. Um, and they allow up to 43 dwelling units per acre, all of, these, all of those residential zoning districts that are recommended for this property. Uh, you, you'll recall that there, there's also a regional commercial and services designation, um, and the implementing districts are the C1-4 neighborhood commercial, C2-4 community commercial, um, an industrial district, and then also a, a public lands and institutional district. Although those are commercial and industrial type districts, it's interesting to note they also allow residential development, and they also allow multifamily residential development, again, up to 43 dwelling units per acre. So even though those, those are commercial and residential districts, they're intended to be mixed use really. And so allow some significant residential development as well. The commercial districts are not intended, they're supposed to be, you know, according to the way that the zoning's written, they're intended to be commercial districts, not strictly residential, but they do allow a mix of uses at, and residential when it occurs at a higher density. So in, in looking at the growth policy, you know, I know that there's more than the future land use map, uh, there are lots of goals, there are policy statements, there's a vision that's provided. Uh, and, you know, I had to really think long and hard about whether this, this property or this project, I mean, complies with the growth policy. But um, I think at the end of the day, on balance, I believe that it does. Um, and I believe that it does, that the RM145 substantially complies with the growth policy and the future land use map, um, because 87% of the property is designated as residential 
high density, greater than 24 units per acre. RM 145, as I just showed you on the table, is an implementing district of the residential high density designation. And also uh, the use, sorry, the allowed density in the RM 145 district is the same density, up to 43 dwelling units per acre, as that that's allowed on the regional commercial and services future land use map designation. Uh, the growth policy also talks about, you know, like I mentioned, lots of goals, policies, um, vision. It's, it's, its main focus, its main thrust is focused inward, as opposed to, you know, sprawling out into farmlands and, and across the valley and down the Bitterroot and, and uh, along the Clark Fork and that sort of thing. And the focus inward approach really, it, it has, in my opinion, from just from reading again this morning, it has kind of two sections. One is it really encourages infill development in the city core, um, but it also encourages development that's on city services and can be served by city services. And uh, it, so served by water, sewer, police, fire, streets, et cetera. Um, this project would support the housing goals as you, you've probably seen, um, Aaron Feehan from Community Housing and Development has strongly supported this project uh, because it would provide, um, it has the potential to provide significant housing for Missoula residents, for renters, potentially owners as well. Uh, however, on the downside, there are some services that, that don't currently exist. You know, the, from uh, communications with the Parks and Rec Department, um, from the, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, transportation folks like Aaron Wilson. Uh, you know, there are, there are things like city parks in the area are substandard. They're not up to the level of service to provide appropriate parks for, for development that could occur at this scale. Uh, the trails in the area are, are somewhat substandard. The property is not currently served by transit, although that can be cured at the building permit process. Uh, the developer can be required upon approval of a building permit or application of a building permit to, to petition into the urban transportation district. Uh, also, there's kind of limited neighborhood commercial. You know, there's, the, there's a um, convenience store located close by. There are a couple of restaurants, Mackenzie River and Cracker Barrel, but, you know, they're it, there definitely would be auto-oriented development that would be necessary, you know, and, and maybe in the future other types of development would be located that could serve these apartments. It's hard to say at this point, but in any event, um, one of the planning board's concerns, as I'll mention, as I'll go into greater detail here in a second, is that the services maybe aren't currently there to serve um, to serve this scale of development that could be that could there be there. Um, the main concern, probably the loudest voice, most often voiced concern by members of the public, and we've gotten a lot of public comments, I know you're aware of that, we've gotten hundreds of, of signed uh, petitions in protest, lots and lots of emails and letters, very articulate, thoughtful comments submitted, and probably the most um, widely and often uh, repeated comment is transportation. People are very concerned about, uh, transport about congestion, traffic congestion in this area, and thinking about what uh, the impacts of you know, several hundred residents, several hundred vehicles would be on Grant Creek Road, on the intersection, um, at the interstate, and that sort of thing. So uh, a couple of points. Number one, um, when a building permit is issued, the city engineering department has the ability to, or, or sorry, when a building permit is applied for, the transportation, uh, the city engineer can require a traffic impact study, and the city engineer, Kevin Slovart, did. The developer submitted a traffic impact study for, it was only for the first couple of, um, couple of buildings that were originally um, addressed in the traffic impact study. So it wasn't full build out. Uh, the city of Missoula has a transportation engineering consultant who works for WGM group who reviewed that and some other folks within the city, city staff reviewed it as well, provided comments, questions, things like that, and asked the developer to address those. The developer's traffic engineer Abilene Traffic Services uh, did revise the traffic impact study and has submitted it back to the city for review um, and, and comments are being generated right now. I do have a letter actually from Stephen McDaniel. He's the, he's the um, traffic engineer who the city's hired. I don't know if you've seen it. It's, in, it's posted online. You have access to it. It's a letter dated August 13th. And just, just quickly, it says, um, the updated TIS is not bulletproof. But after enough digging through the appendices, many of my concerns have been addressed. Grant Creek is built with a two-way left road, two-way left turn lane that will allow left vehicles onto both Expo Parkway and Stonebridge Road while not affecting the operations of the northbound through movements. 
Most of the egress traffic out of the site will be making a right turn and headed south into town, which allows for the existing geometrics to operate decently well, even in full build out conditions. He goes on to say essentially that um, there are improvements that are being made by MDT right now to the intersection, um, the southbound lanes uh, headed, headed down reserve. And so uh, those improvements are a right-hand turn lane onto the interstate. So it would be a westbound uh, interstate entrance. There's another uh, southbound through lane onto reserve that goes under the un interstate underpass that's being built right now. And also MBT is, is optimizing or improving the traffic signals right now. And that, that project is expected to be completed this fall. So improvements are being made. And what I'm getting from uh, Mr. Daniel's analysis of the traffic impact study is that essentially he, he found that, uh, that this proposal would not have a significant impact on the transportation uh, facility. Now it goes into greater detail. That's kind of a nutshell, it's a summary, but in any event. And additionally, my last point on transportation right now is that at the building permit process, the developer can be required to actually make improvements. So uh, improve things like sidewalks, uh, contribute to trails, um, build a bus stop, potentially turn lanes or what, what might have to happen to accommodate the development. So city engineer has the authority to require that so that can be addressed. Dave, we've got a couple more questions. Um, I have uh, Heather Harp and then Mirta Becerra. Thank you, Jordan. Dave, this is just a really great presentation so far. I, I love how you're outlining all this one, <clears throat> one page at a time. Um, my question is around transportation. So I may have missed it, um, but I was wondering, can you please describe the, um, the traffic calming or the um, traffic devices that allow people to exit the um, the development onto Grant Creek? Is that a stop sign? Is that a stoplight? Is that a roundabout? Uh, I think at this point, the proposal is, or you know, what's there today are just stop signs. Okay. So people exiting the, exiting the project down Expo Parkway or Stonebridge would, for the most part, be taking a right, you know, headed south to, into town. So there'd be stop signs there. Okay, so if I was gonna be making a left because I wanna go up the drainage and recreate, I, I worry about traffic backing up behind me or, or trying to make a, a dangerous um, pass, trying to uh, turn northward. Any concerns there with, with all this additional traffic that could be coming? Um, I don't believe so. And I'll have to look back at the traffic impact study. I'll have to see how that was analyzed, whether it was analyzed. You know, I think the assumptions in a traffic study and actually was supported by city staff is that the vast majority of the, the turns are going to be into town. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That's it for right now. Thank you. Okay. Next up, Mirta followed by Heidi. Thank you. Um, I just want to piggyback on what um, um, Heather was pointing out that I find it hard to believe that the assumption is that people are only going to make a right hand turn out of that development, considering that there could be potential um, trips, particularly during the winter for snow um, making a left. That would be nearly impossible um, as it is right now. Um, you can't make it's it's really difficult, if not impossible, to make a left hand turn out of Expo Parkway as it is. And I'm also curious to know whether the, there was any on-site or at that particular intersection study done where the tubes to do traffic counts on, uh, about the actual piece of property, about the actual intersection, or what metrics did we use in order to come up with those um, assumptions? So yes, um, the, the traffic engineer, Avalon Traffic Services did do an on-site study. I'll tell you what though, I think it's more appropriate for, he's available at this meeting and intends to present. So I, I would rather have him address those questions than me. I, you know, I'm, a, I'm kind of a generalist planner. I've read the TIS and I'm familiar with these types of things, but I think um, he could address those questions better than I. Thanks. Okay, uh, Heidi. Sorry, I was a few minutes late to the meeting, so uh, 
I, forgive me if these things were covered, but I was wondering if you could just um, explain where Grant Creek is in relationship to this property. And then my second question is around the levee that is um, in this area. I'm not sure exactly where it's located. Um, could you point out where the levee is um, in relationship to this property? Sure. First, I'm going to go back to an aerial photo. Um, doesn't show it real great, but basically Grant Creek is along, it's right along the roadway, really. It's right along Grant Creek Road. And the levee, uh, I've seen a map of it. I believe it essentially parallels Grant Creek on the west side. And then I don't have do, a map available, though. Do we have an idea of what the area is that that levee protects? Like, does this fall into X protected by levee or? You not? know, uh, there's a floodplain map I know that shows that right now. Uh, if you don't mind, I, I don't have access to it at the moment, or it would take me some some fumbling to try to try to get it. But let me make a note, if you don't mind, and and. The next time that we get together, or maybe later in this in this discussion, I can I can. That'd be it. great. Those floodplain maps aren't fun to work with. They're kind of clunky. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, thanks, um, Amber, and then Gwen. So, um, Dave, you said that the uh, traffic study had the first couple of buildings um, was done based on the first couple of buildings. Can you tell us what percentage and how many car trips? Like, what does that translate into? I mean, how much how much of what the ultimate impact would be is that study? Well, I think that the first TIS addressed the first two buildings, if, I'm, if my memory serves me, it was about 386 units or what was first evaluated. You know, city staff is concerned about that. They felt that it just it didn't really provide a um, sufficient picture of what could actually happen on the property. You know, if you're going to if you if you city councilors uh, amend the zoning, Lots of different things could happen on the property. It would be zoned, you know, RM 145, which of course is a residential district, but you don't know exactly what the scale of development would act, would eventually turn out to be in reality. So city you know, public works staff and engineering staff thought it was important to take a more comprehensive look. And so uh, requested the developer do that, that the traffic study be updated. And that's available to you. Um, honestly, I haven't had a chance to study it I've uh, been working on a 347 lot subdivision <laughs> lately in addition to this project. So, um, but I'll, I'll certainly be prepared to discuss that at the public hearing. That's great. Um, Jordan, may I have one more question? Sure, go ahead. Um, and I'm just curious because I, I don't fully understand it. Um, what the petition into the, to petition into an urban transportation district, what does that mean? And is that a guarantee that we're actually could have bus service up can you just explain how that works? Well, um, you know, I'm fairly new to the city, and so maybe someone else has better knowledge than I, but I'll start with what I know. Um, the, the property is not currently within the urban transportation district, so it does not pay essentially taxes to support Mountain Line. Uh, petitioning into the district would mean that taxes would be applied, taxes would be collected and then applied to support Mountain Line. According to Vince Caristo uh, from from the transportation district. Uh, there are plans to serve this area in the future uh, to add a to add a bus, you know, bus service to this area. However, it's not guaranteed. It's going to contingent on funding, of course, and and other priorities and things like that. So it's not it's not a guarantee, but that's that's in the long range plan. And I guess similarly, if you don't mind, you know, I mentioned that um, that the trails are somewhat substandard in the area right now. There are plans, particularly through the uh, the Scott Street, um, what's it called? The Scott Street Revitalization Plan. Um, in any event, there are there are plans to improve trails in this area to link this area to to kind of central Missoula downtown area. But those are plans. They're not those facilities. Of course, you know the trails aren't in place today. So it's and the planning board struggled with this a little bit. Uh, that it was a kind of a chicken and egg thing. Should we have all of this, you know, should should there be bus service already? Should, you know, before we approve the zoning, should there be trails in place? Should all the, you know, all these other concerns be addressed before the develop before the zone change? Or can they happen kind of, can they be phased in over time? And so that was a, a real kind of a sticking point for the planning board. And, you know, it's a it's kind of a head scratcher. 
Right. Thank, thank you. Yeah. And I, I agree. If I lived up here, all my, with uh, my colleagues, all my recreation would be to the left. All, everything other than, you know, trips to the store and things. All right. Uh, Gwen. Thanks. Um, first of all, I wanted to point out, I think the, um, the August 13th letter from Stephen McDaniel, who I think is the traffic engineer, was actually attached to the Heron's Landing topic that we're hearing later on today. And um, maybe it's also attached to um, this item. I was having some difficulty scrolling down, which that's my issue on my um, computer, but I just wanted to let you know there's a, there's a few things I think that are actually this Grant Creek rezone that are attached to Heron's Landing. So FYI, if you can't find them, um, and then I had a question regarding the um, the growth policy, Dave. So I think we have a really good, well thought out growth policy, and I understand that the recommendation for this chunk of land is high residential. But I'm, I'm contrasting that with basically this bottleneck because of the way the infrastructure is built with um, I-90 butting up against the, the, um, the hillsides here. It, it's really a bottleneck coming down trying to get out of Grant Creek. So my question is when the, the grant or the, the growth policy is a, a general document that is kind of from the top down. And I know a ton of work went into it for several years while it was created. And now we're in the, the phase of, of revisiting it and updating it. But to what degree when they do the growth policy, do they get into kind of a micro analysis of, we're recommending high density here, but there is a traffic issue. How, how far do they take that analysis before giving them a recommendation? Because there's certainly an issue here. Yeah. Um... You know, I wasn't involved with the city of Missoula's growth policy, uh, but I've worked on a lot of growth policies in Montana. And, you know, I think you try to look at all of these factors when developing a growth policy. You try to look at the soil types, you know, is it prime agricultural soil? Is there wildlife habitat? Are there water quality impacts? Is the, is the site suitable? Um, you know, I, I can't tell you how the designation was, was applied. You know, frankly, I wish that the hillside had a, an open and resource designation, for example, you know, it, um, but they applied it, they, they looked at the property boundaries, they looked at the type of development, you know, nearby, you know, I, I can't tell you exactly how this analysis was done, but uh, regarding transportation, I did want to point out one thing, and that is when, when looking at the staff report, when, when trying to think about how we were going to write the staff report and the recommendation we were going to make as staff people, we reached out uh, to the fire department, to the Montana Department of Transportation, to um, city engineering and public works departments, to the, uh, the county, what's it called, Department of Emergency Services. You know, we were specifically asked them, do you see, and, and city police as well, do you see public health and safety threats with this proposal? Uh, because a lot of people, we, are, we know that traffic is a, a significant issue. I know that trying to pull out you know, um, get onto the interstate from the, the gas station that, that lane, you know, cars stack. Um, we know that there are potential issues there. We know that this up, up, in, up the drainage in particular, it's wildland urban interface, there are fire concerns, things like that. So we specifically reached out to these agencies to ask, are there public health and safety threats? And I just, we didn't get anything back from them pointing in that direction. You know, the, there was a, no comment from the Department of Emergency Services. Uh, the city fire department essentially said we can serve it. They just need to comply with the building codes. Montana Department of Transportation specifically said um, that the, the that the facilities, the transportation facilities, can safely serve this development. So you know, as staff people, it's it's kind of hard for me to say that there's going to be a public health and safety threat. I don't really have evidence to do that. I guess I know that there's kind of a a human element to it as well, but I'm. I need to rely on, and I suggest that you, city councilors, also rely on the public safety professionals to help inform your decision. So that's that's why that's why we came up with the decision we did, or at least in part. Thanks. Thanks. Um, let's take one more question now, and then um, Dave, you can carry on with the staff report, um, and then we'll um, we'll do we'll have plenty of time for more questions. Um, so, Mirta. Thank you, um, Dave. You just pointed out something that made me. Um, 
trigger a question. Uh, we know there are issues currently with um, traffic. We know it is very likely that there will be increased issues um, if this development comes to fruition. So just like with any other infrastructure, like stormwater, for example, we come up with mitigation measures and plans. So what is the mitigation measure that's being proposed to alleviate, mitigate um, the, the foreseeable um, traffic impact? So in the short term, um, nothing. You know, the way that the process would work is the, and, and the transportation engineer can address this as well, but the way I understand it, it you know, when you are, when you change the zoning, it doesn't mean that you necessarily, there's no additional impact immediately, but over time, there will be additional impact as assuming buildings are built um, and, and vehicle trips emerge and things like that. So the city of Missoula has the authority under your title 20 and others, um, when a building permit is applied for, the city engineer, again, can require a TIS that specifically evaluates that phase. And if impacts are identified, uh, they can require mitigation at that time. So there is an, a mechanism in place, uh, but, it, but it's more phased in. It's not an immediate, okay, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna change the zoning, you need to install turn lanes or traffic signals or something like that. It's something that can be developed over time to address the impact as it comes online. Uh, may I have a follow-up, please? Yeah, go ahead. And, and, and I understand that, but my concern is that if we leave those big uh, potential uh, mitigation impacts or measures for the building approval or building permit approval process, um, that could have a significant impact even more so to the larger community because say we need um, another way, provide another exit, in, ingress and egress to the property. That would that would be a, a tremendous challenge. So, why are we not looking at that now instead of waiting for the um, building permit approval? And I'm also curious about the impact that construction for all the phases of this development would have on this um, intersection. So while we're not looking at the traffic impact of the future residents of this area, we are looking at all the traffic generated by the development that if phased out, we're looking at many years of development. So has that been taken into account um, during the recommendation for approval for this rezone proposal? Uh, well, you know, I think there's an existing situation in the Grant Creek drainage that, that ought to be addressed. I think a second, you know, as a planner, as a uh, someone who thinks about public health and safety, a second way in and out of Grant Creek would be a darn good idea. And uh, that's a condition that exists today. Um, would this exacerbate it? Potentially, it's hard to say for sure, but there's the potential for it. Um, so I think that's something that ought to be addressed. I, I had a conversation with Jeremy Keene, public works director recently, and he was talking about a potential um, way out down Expo Parkway, Old Indian Trail there to the left. And then and then I believe that there's a, a way that might be developed under the interstate. So it could provide a you know a second ingress and egress if there's a bottleneck right at that at that light. But maybe something up the drainage would be a little more appropriate as well, something that heads out to the east. Um, and it looks to me, you know, I haven't been up there in quite a few years, but you know I think there's the potential to make that happen. That's something that, you know, honestly from a public safety perspective would make a lot of sense. I think your fire um, especially wildland firefighters would say it's, it's pretty darn important. So uh, is it something that we've thought about? Yeah, it's something we have thought about. Um, you know, it's an existing condition. It's not necessarily due to the development. De would the development exacerbate it? Maybe. Um, hard to say for sure, but it wouldn't alleviate it. But I don't know that it's the developer's responsibility necessarily to make that happen. You know, it's kind of a citywide issue as well. So those are my thoughts. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I do have a couple more hands up. Um, I was hoping to move on. Um, Julie and Heidi, do you have, um, can, are your questions pertaining to this part of the staff report or can they can they wait till Dave finishes his presentation? I can wait. My comment is directly to um, what Myrta was just asking about, okay, if I could. Yeah, go, go, go ahead. Um, I believe uh, um, Ms. Becerra is aware that we cannot condition zoning so they're asking staff to have mitigation measures outlined at this point in the process um, 
seems like um, an unrealistic expectation. Um, if what we are asking or if what we want to ask for is a development agreement, then that's a whole nother conversation, but, but we can't condition zoning. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Julie. Um, Dave, you wanna, you wanna carry on? And also for the record, um, uh, Stacy Anderson joined us about 10 minutes ago. I apologize for not noting that. Okay, um, Dave, how much how much more staff report do you have remaining? Uh, not a whole lot. Okay, you want, you want, you want to move carry through? on? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, you have certain re review criteria when evaluating a zone change under state law and also Title Twenty. There are specific re review criteria. Uh, compliance with the growth policy. I've kind of covered that already. Um, public services and transportation. Um, that's a, a sticking point here, certainly. You know, how would this impact, how would the zone change impact public services and transportation? Certainly it can be served by city water, sewer, police, fire, et cetera. Transportation is one where, where there's um, concern. Would it promote compatible urban growth? This is an interesting one. And these are all kind of fairly subjective, you know, uh, honestly. Some people have said that this is this development, the development that could be allowed here is not compatible. I, I disagree, uh, personally. I find that you know, you've got auto-oriented commercial to the south along the interstate. Uh, this would provide something of a buffer between single-family residential to the north and the and the auto-oriented commercial to the south. Um, to the east is the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. It wouldn't, in my view, wouldn't really be impacted by uh, the zone change. Um, they may disagree. You have uh, condominiums to the east, smaller scale, but still condominiums. You know, to me, and, and then, you know, you're using a, a gravel pit essentially for what could be multifamily. I don't see that that uh, multifamily residential is out of character with the area or incompatible with the other types of residential development and uh, services that are in the area. Would it promote public health and safety? You know, again, there's city fire, police, um, water, sewer. Uh, MDT has told us that, that the road system can safely accommodate the traffic. So in my view, yes, public health and safety would be promoted. Uh, how does this consider the district character and suitability of uses? Um, you know, it, it's reuse of a, of a gravel pit again. And, um, you know, I feel like the residential in this area would help to meet. It, it is, suited, it's, your growth policy says that this site is suited for high density residential development. That's a statement of public policy that was thoughtfully developed over time. So to, kind of, to me, that's what it boils down to is you've done the planning. You know, I'm a, I'm a strong believer in planning. I'm sure you all are as well. You know, you take the time to really consider development. Uh, you consider all the policies, all the goals that you have. You develop a plan. Once you have a plan, you know, I, I think it's important to try to stick to it. Uh, certainly in every, you know, it's, it's not in every circumstance. You're going to find maybe you made a mistake or something like that. But, but the plan says that high density residential should go here. So um, I think that's a statement of public policy and, and, that, and that you've found already that the site is suitable for this particular use. Would this correct an inconsistency or error in the zoning or meet a challenge uh, of changing conditions? It would not correct an inconsistency or error. However, you know, the, the challenge of changing conditions I'd ask you to consider is uh, the, the housing need. You know, it, um, we need housing big time in the city of Missoula, all types of housing, not just subsidized housing, not just quote unquote affordable housing, but all types. And the proposal would allow for multifamily units that could help uh, provide additional supply. Um, whether that would actually lower prices, I don't know, but, um, but it would provide additional supply to the housing market and meet a demand. And then is this in the best interest of the city as a whole? Well, again, you've got a pretty subjective criterion here, but at the end of the day, I look back at the growth policy and I look at the comments from your, your public safety professionals, um, transportation professionals, engineering, and housing professionals and, and what I'm getting is that although there are concerns, although maybe the site's not perfect, uh, although you may not have level of service for parks that's appropriate at this day, you know, at this time, although you might not have, well, you might have some, some issues uh, with transit and non-motorized transportation, those things may be, may be alleviated over time. So 
my view is that yes, this would be in the best interest of the city as a whole. So uh, staff recommended to approve adoption of, of, to approve the rezoning essentially, based on the findings in the staff report. However, the planning board voted differently. They, are, they recommended uh, after a public hearing to deny the request. And I'll just go into quickly um, some of the issues that were brought up at the planning board meeting. There was a great discussion, great deliberation about this. Ultimately, the, the board voted, I think it was seven to two, uh, to oppose or to deny uh, the proposal. And But they great discussion, talked about reasons that it might be appropriate, the pros, uh, the reasons that it, it might be inappropriate, the cons. And I think, you know, some of the main concerns were, again, adequate facilities may not be available today to serve the development, um, that the existing development that's allowed on the site, almost 500 units, is pretty significant uh, in terms of meeting the housing demand, uh, concern about traffic, and also environmental concerns, single occupancy vehicle trips, things along those lines, and also mention of Grant Creek water quality concerns, wildlife movement, um, things like that. So um, that was the kind of the board deliberation. You know, on the on the other side, it's a gravel pit. It's a you know good reuse. You've planned for it. This would help to meet the city's housing goals, uh, etc. So that was kind of the discussion in a nutshell. That was about five hours of discussion. I just boiled down for you right there. So it's probably I'm probably lacking some details, but you get the idea. I encourage you all to watch the planning board too. It was um, it was a robust discussion. Um, okay, so. Dave, do you, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Carry on if, if you have more slides. No, I'm, that's, that concludes the presentation. Okay, can you, I have a, a question about uh, process, I guess. Can you talk about um, the protest provision and um, the, st the status of that? Right, I did have one more slide, thanks. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> the, um, so under Montana law and also uh, your zoning, if protest petitions are signed by owners of 25% or more of the lots, or units within 150 feet of the property, then that triggers uh, a higher threshold to approval. Essentially, it means that at least two thirds of the present voting members of council are needed to approve a zone change. And in this case, 31.5% uh, of the property owners within 150 feet submitted valid protests uh, to the zone change. So that triggers the super majority requirement for approval. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Dave, for the thorough staff report. Um, I've got a list of uh, folks in the queue for questions. Um, I think we'll do questions for a, a, a short period of time, and then we'll go to the, um, the developer and, and uh, the developer's representatives um, for their presentation material. Um, and then again, some questions, and then we'll go to the, um, the um, uh, groups that have um, expressed interest in providing um, uh, presentation in opposition. Um, so um, I've got Heidi followed by Amber and then Heather. Uh, so my question is just about which zoning codes are called out as being high density by our growth policy. I have it um, pulled up, but I haven't found it yet. Um, could you just repeat which, which ones those are? It's the column on the left. So RM1, 35 is already considered high density. That's right. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Amber and then Heather. Yeah, thanks Dave, that was a great presentation um, and answered a lot of my questions, but I'm curious about with the fire piece, um, you know, that that's a big concern for me with the one way out and, um, and I've, been enough. I don't live in that area, but I've spent enough time up there. I recognize the the uh, traffic issues right now. Um, so I, I'm just curious um, if if you reached out to the wildland firefighter piece. I mean, does that play into this? Because my concern is not a house fire. I think that our firefighters will will get up. Our city firefighters will get up there. My concern is a major wildfire coming down that drainage and people not being able to get out. Could you, so has there been any, does that, could you just go into that a little more? That's, that's kind of one of my real concerns in this. Sure, no, we did not specifically reach out to the DNRC or, um, or US Forest Service. Uh, I can certainly do that. I'll, I'll see if 
if I can get uh, have a conversation with someone from one of those agencies before the, the public hearing. Um, we've heard from members of the public who are experienced wildland firefighters who expressed concern, but um, but the answer is no. I did not specifically reach out to wildland fire folks. Thanks. That would that'd be great. I'd just like to hear a little more about from that side of it, if you don't mind. And another thing on that, um, since since this is a single access point to, to rural areas, um, I would be kind of interested in um, what the response typically is up in the county um, for for um, you know if if rural fire tends to respond or if, if Missoula fire tends to respond through our mutual aid agreement. Um, and um, I, I imagine just based on proximity to stations that that probably city fire would be more likely to respond to a county property up there, but I'd just be kind of curious if, if fire has any comment on, on that kind of response. Um, okay, Amber, are you, do you have more or are you done? Okay. I'm done, thank you. Great, so Heather is next. All right, uh, I have a couple questions. Um, just so I have a better understanding of this particular part of Ward 2, um, Dave, do you, can you speak to what the existing population is of this area, of this vicinity and northward? And what our expected population will be um, at the completion of the different phases? Uh, let's see, I'm going off memory here. I asked Eric Anderson from the GIS department to look at the number of uh, address points in the Grand Creek area. And I think there are roughly 800 address points uh, currently. The proposal. I'll tell you what, though. Let me, as as other presentations are going on, I'll I'll look back at my notes to try to get a more definitive answer for you. There. Okay, I, I I'm just really trying to understand um, what kind of change we're going to um, be potentially experiencing, just so that I can wrap my head around that. And uh, this next question isn't for Dave, but I would like just to plant this seed for the um, for the developer as you speak. I know we can't condition zoning, but a lot of what we talk about on council also speaks to making sure our, we, we build affordable housing. And I would like you to address what percentage of your housing units that you plan to do are gonna be permanently affordable. And then Dave, I have one question for you remaining. And that is um, one of the other zoning types that we see quite a bit in throughout our city is RM 2.7. And I was wondering if you could just kind of compare and contrast just briefly how that compares to RM-135 or RM-145. Uh, RM-2.7 is an urban scale. I'm going to have to, I want to get, pull it up here so I can be definitive, but it's an urban scale residential district. And the 2.7 refers to minimum lot size. It would allow lot sizes down to 2,700 square feet. And just pulling it up now. Um, RM 2.7 allows all types of residences. Well, building types, detached homes, lot line homes two unit townhouses, two unit house. So it doesn't allow, RM 2.7 would not allow uh, multi-dwelling homes or buildings. So not apartments basically. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, Gwen, did you still have a question? Oh, no. excuse me. No. Can I correct my answer? I'm sorry, I made no. a mistake. I was looking at RT 2.7. RM 2.7 would allow all residential building types. Okay. Including apartments. Okay, Marita? Thank you. Um, Dave, as we um, contemplate and move uh, and make investments to move towards form-based code, do you think that this proposed um, zoning would be in line with what we would recommend should we have our new code um, in place? I guess what I'm getting at, do you think that this um, recommend the zoning is in line and would, um, get us to the goals that we continue to talk about for um, a form-based code type of um, um, zoning? Um, gosh, that's a tough one because 
you know, form-based code, like the name implies, often refers to the form of structures. So architectural type things, um, how it blends in with the, the environment, um, and less so about the use itself. So it's hard to, I, I'm not sure how to answer the question, counselor. Okay. Um, Dave, can you talk a little bit about, um, this is a really large parcel or, or two, two large parcels. Um, and I know that it's split zoned um, and that there, um, can you talk about alternate paths forward that the developer um, could have selected, um, whether that be subdivision and rezone, whether that be boundary line relocation. My understanding is that a boundary line relocation would not be viable because it would create new split zone parcels. Um, but I, can you just talk through sort of some of the other um, the other paths that that could have been considered um, and maybe some background on, on how this request came to be? Uh, well, this request started before I arrived at the city of Missoula. So I don't have a, a ton of history there, um, but I can tell you that there are multiple options for the developer on the property. I'll go back to, so here again is the zoning map. So the Northern parcel uh, could be developed under the R5.4 rules, which essentially is a single family residential type district, single, you know, single unit residential uh, and several hundred homes, I think it's, was it three, 300 homes could be developed there, 155, sorry, in the northern parcel, so 155, up to 155 single dwelling units, I'm looking at the bottom of the table, bottom kind of middle column, could be developed under R5.4. Um, the southern parcel, and this is as of right, essentially, they would have to come in for a subdivision, so to develop single family residences, you know, and sell those, you have to subdivide the property, go through a subdivision review process, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that, that process. You're going to get really familiar with it here soon, not because we've got some subdivisions coming your way, but um, it is an owner. It's a law. It's an onerous process. It takes, you know, roughly a year to go through the preliminary approval process. Um, and then there's lots of work that has to be done after that. So it takes quite a while to get to get homes on the market. Uh, it's it's a process that's set up under state law. You know, the Missoula, of course, has city subdivision regulations, every jurisdiction in the state of Montana is required to have subdivision regulations. So it, it could be, the property though could be subdivided. It's a process that's it's more difficult, it's more expensive and time consuming for the developer. It takes longer to get homes on the market, but also allows, you know, from the public's perspective, it allows impacts to be addressed more thoroughly than under the process that you're looking at right now. You know, what you're looking at right now is simply change the zoning and then the developer comes in for building permits. And those are addressed at the staff level, essentially, not at the planning board, not at the council level. There's less community input. So subdivision is very valuable in that respect, is that the impacts can be closely evaluated. There's a public vetting process, uh, but that, that is, does not have to happen, you know, when multifamily homes are built, just it's the peculiarity of Montana law. Uh, and so on the north parcel, I'm sorry, the south parcel, uh, the develop, you know, RM35 is the applicable zoning today. So the developer could simply submit building permits. Uh, in fact, has submitted a building permit application for the southern parcel and, and one's been issued for a multifamily structure on that southern parcel. And you can see that all together under the current zoning, you know, almost 400, it's 494 units maximum that could be permitted today. So that was one option. Um, and probably the path of least resistance, with the exception of the subdivision. You know, the other option is there could potentially be a, a boundary line adjustment. You see that there are two lots, southern lot and northern lot. Um, but I don't know that it would get the developer that far. I guess you could adjust the boundary so that it aligns with, uh, it runs northwest, southeast, along with the C1-4, you know, the pink shade or the salmon colored shade there. So that would allow, um, you know, that area to be developed with multifamily or commercial or what have you. But again, the R5.4 would be required or single family residential would be required on the northern parts. So those are a couple of options. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have several more questions. I think I'm gonna hold those um, until after we hear from the other presenters. Um, does anyone else have questions that they wanna get out right now um, for Dave? 
Okay, seeing none. Um, so next we have our, um, our uh, applicant team. And I believe that um, we have Ken Alt and Mike Morgan here. Um, maybe, do you, would you two like to kick it off and, and introduce your, um, your team and um, maybe go through and let us know who all's here uh, from your team? Um, and um, in the interest of, of, um, of fairness, I'm going to be monitoring time, um, you know, and so if we need to move along, I'll let you know. But, um, but um, go ahead and introduce everyone on your team um, and maybe let us know who else, you know, who's here from like the traffic study team and, that, and, and, and whatnot. Um, and then if you have any presentation, you're, you're welcome to go ahead and, and launch into that. Just get all the, yeah, go ahead, sir. I'm Ken Alt. Uh, I'm the owner of uh, 2920 uh, Expo Way, uh, also KJA Development. Uh, I'm here with uh, Cody Swartz with Worth Engineering, Mike Morgan with uh, Morgan uh, Architecture, Hoffman um, and Associates. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have another gentleman, Bob uh, Aveline, is, is our traffic uh, engineer. And uh, I I would, there was a lot of questions about the traffic and uh, let's look to him and he, he's, uh, he's the professional at that. Um, I'd like to give you my opinion. I've heard a lot of opinions, but let's, 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 let's wait for his, uh, his ability to answer some of those. Um, I, I guess I would just want to uh, tell you a little bit about myself. I've developed three other projects or upper or bigger apartment projects in town, many small ones, but uh, the uh, the Edgewood Apartments on the north side, Ashland Place Apartments on California, and then just recently the Brooklyn West Apartments on uh, Mullen Road. So um, I've been doing this uh, for quite a while, and, and that kind of takes me into, my next step is in, uh, the planning board kind of told us, you know, hey, we need to look at this and do some more planning. And I would argue that I've been planning a project like this for roughly 20 years and going from one to another uh, in the last uh, nine years, I've actually lived in these apartments for seven of those. And when you live there, you get, you get to see um, what works, what, what can be improved. And um, when this property became available to buy, it opened up a ton of those improvements. And uh, I want to talk about the difference between the 135, the RM 135 and the RM 145 that gives us the ability to uh, offer those improvements. Um, if, we, if we could put on uh, the, the two slides with, uh, or the, the three story for Mullen. The three, the three short from Mola. Okay, so here, here we have uh, a project we just did. This is mostly three story. There's two four story buildings in there. Um, but what, what we don't want to get, what we don't want to happen, and I think the neighborhood of Grant or the friends of Grant Creek don't either. They, this is what we would be forced to do if we got put into a box where we had to do the three-story buildings and bring it back to the MR-135. Um, if you could see the, uh, uh, I don't know right now, I I can see this. This little spot right here, this is a four, there's a 40 by 40 requirement uh, for open space or activity space. That's a little bit bigger. We were able to get about 40 by 50. And then we have a little bit of a, a green area here. And a couple backyards I got fairly good size of, um, of back in here. Uh, to the east, you got the tallest of apartments and here's their area. What, what the RM145, what I wanna show you, what it allows us to do just on the site. 
And I, I want you to take a look and just absorb what I'm trying to say. We don't have to agree on it today, but just why we're asking for that 145. Uh, go to that. Uh, yeah. Same, same. yeah, the concept. If this is to scale, um, for something to use as a tool, of one of those parking spot lines is 18 feet. And so what when we when we go lesser buildings and, and put our or stack our density to another height, I just want to point out the area that we gained. We have basically that, you know, this is this is almost 40 feet from the back of the sidewalk to this building. And so we're we're creating so much green space, open space. And that's probably the biggest amenity besides parking is space in these apartment complexes. And, and, and I'm going to go back into a story here. You know, 50, 10 to 15 years ago, you couldn't find an apartment that allowed pets. Well, now, now you, you, to stay in the game, you have to allow pets. But there was never that step taken to say, hey, we need some space for these pets. Because if I go back to that 40 by 40 space that we had to do in our last project, um, I'm reminded of me of a, 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 of a young couple that had two little boys that played in that area. Meanwhile, there's four uh, other tenants coming up with their dogs on their leashes, um, doing their business in that spot. And when I saw that, I lived right above the area and I watched that time and time again. It's like, you know, you know we, this is all I have to offer uh, young families with, with kids that, that want to just let them go play out in the immediate yard, you know, to send them to a park that's uh, a mile away or in another subdivision. Um, we, we can provide that here. We can, we can, uh, um, we can make this lifestyle here more of just a come home, lock yourself in your apartment and, uh, you know, jump in your car and take off to do something else. This also allows, um, us to provide onsite amenities in one of the plan planning board members talked about, you know, we don't have a grocery store. Let's get a grocery store in here. Well, she's right. We don't have a grocery store here. Um, it's probably not a good fit for a grocery store, but what we can do is, is eliminate trips um, with our on-site amenities. I, I also observed while I lived in these complexes is the first thing people do when they come home from work is grab their dog, jump in the car and head to Blue Mountain, head to Paddy Canyon, head to Rattlesnake and, and, provide, and create a trip. Um, they're jumping in the cars, going to the gym, the you know, a handful of complexes in Missoula have a small gym in their offices or their community centers. They're, they get used about five to 10% of the people use them. Majority of them still go to the gyms. We are providing a gym, a full gymnasium, in court, a full court basketball court indoors with classrooms available where we can, we can provide that social um, aspect of, of, of working out. Um, we also have an area in the center here that is about 50% of the entire area of Brooklyn West. And it's, it's just open space. I mean, the kids can play soccer. Uh, we're planning on a second pool in the area. So we'll be, we'll be finding a spot for that. Um, but we also have, uh, areas where there's 20, there's 24 or there's about 20 acres on a hillside where we can, we can provide a hiking trail of our own. Uh, also a dog run where we can actually let them, let them loose. Uh, we've got a bench that sits above, um, it's where the existing grade was. Um, it's right behind basically the outline of the buildings here, uh, right in here that provides a, it's a, it's a 40 foot bench around there. You know, that we can create, spots for these people to be active on site. So yeah, people are gonna get in their car and leave and, and some of them are gonna get and turn left, um, but we, we were providing them a spot where they can do it here on site. Um, the area provides itself already with an awesome trail up, up Grant Creek. And we've heard neighbors concerned about, well, we're just gonna make it so busy that you know no one's gonna to wanna to use it. Well, I would I'd like to bring them down to the Milwaukee Trail, the Kim Williams Trail. Those, those trails are awesome. And, and, and that's Missoula getting on the trail. They're not, they're not overloaded. They're not packed. 
Um, I spent two years at uh, Ashland Place, lived right on the trail. I was on that trail daily for two years. It's, you, you don't overpopulate these trails. It's more of a, it's a fun thing to run into a, a neighbor or a friend or someone else with a dog or someone that wants to pet your dog. It's a fun thing. That's, that's Missoula. This, this site here um, provides more infrastructure. The more we, we hear the neighbors talk about, well, it doesn't have the infrastructure. Well, for the type of development we are trying to do, and, and I want to go back to a geographic or demographic on our other projects. Uh, we had about 74% that are professionals, 9% uh, retired, and 16% students. One of the demands in Missoula is just apartments. We need more units. There's, there are, they say we need 9,000 units by 2035. But one, one area that hasn't been addressed, and it's been on the, uh, the demand list, I guess, for years, is three-bedroom apartments. And we're, we're providing a family lifestyle here. We're providing roughly 125 three-bedroom units. So we're not only are we solving an issue or helping solve an issue of demand for apartments, we are, we are looking up and we're designing a site that is family friendly, um, that, that it's not out there. You know, call it transitional housing. This isn't entry level. Oh, that, that, my time's getting close to be running out. But um, one of one of the other trip, the trip things that we're saving trips on is, you know, we got a, we've got a, a convenience store within our community center. Um, so so quick trips wherever they need to go can be limited, um, but mostly it's it's on site. It's all here. So I guess I better wrap up right now. I can get halfway through my deal, but um, we have uh, others that want to. Talk more about factual stuff and, or not factual stuff, but um, design and uh, um, engineering stuff. So, uh, Mike. Hello, I'm Mike Morgan, I'm an architect. I'm the principal architect of Hoffman Morgan and Associates. We've known Ken for a couple of, um, a long time, and we've done a lot of projects with him in the past years. And he came to us early in 2019. Um, he found a site that he was pretty excited about. And, he asked the student a feasibility study to see what this land might be able to offer and what it could best suit the city's uh, needs for. And uh, I respect how Ken has lived on his developments. That's an education that you just can't get any other way by actually observing and knowing what works and what doesn't. I just want to really acknowledge how much I respect that and how much that value brings to the table here. But. Uh, so when we went and did our feasibility study, the first thing we went to is the growth policy, which they've touched on very well, because that's really our epicenter for our city planning is, is, our, is our growth policy. And so then we went to the land use map. And uh, the land use map is, uh, it tells us what is planned for this property. And it's a mix of uh, transitional land use, which I think is, they did a really good job at it. It's, at the southern portion of the property along Expo Parkway, it's, it's uh, land use designated regional commercial and services, which is a high density type of use, uh, regional commercial allows commercial use, high density residential. And then the rest of the property is uh, designated for high density residential. <clears throat> so, okay, that tells us a lot of good information right there that a lot of planning had put into place that we can rely on. Next, we went to the zoning map and we looked at what the city provided zoning map and what zoning says that's allowed on this property to this day. And it's pretty good balance and alignment with the growth policy. Along Expo, it's C1-4. That allows us about any use you want to do other than maybe industrial uses. Um, it allows a 110 foot height limit, uh, commercial, high density, residential. <clears throat> it's, it's a really a good designation for that Southern piece. Then it goes into majority of the property is RM135, which is high density residential with a 35 foot high limit. The northern piece of the property is R5.4, which is a, a lower density residential. Um, and I want to point out that that area that R5.4 is designated is, is all in, almost all in the hillside part of the property. This is a 46 acre property, 24 of it's flat and the remaining of it is hillside, undevelopable. So we have 24 acres about 
developable area. The R5.4 area, all but just a little bit of it, is undevelopable. <coughs> just a little bit of it right in here. So no matter what zone this land gets, in this area that's zoned R5.4 right now, we can't develop any land. So it really doesn't matter what the zone is. We're not going to build on it. We can't. Okay, so then we went into um, infrastructure. And this is a big subject, a lot of topics. I'll try to hit it quickly because I know we have, don't have a lot of time. But there's a lot to talk about here. First is utilities. And I'm not going to touch too much on that. I'm going to let Cody here, our civil engineer, touch on that more. But uh, the bottom line is, is that all the utilities are in place and ready for this property because that's what was planned for this area. It's already there. The infrastructure is in place. That is a good sign that, that that means this area is ready for development. We don't need to plan further because it's already been planned for and is ready for development. Uh, fire and police is another one. Um, each of these departments have options to add comment. Um, and fire and police really didn't add comment. And why is that? Well, the reason is that there isn't an issue for them. If there was, we can be guaranteed that they would let us know what that issue is. The reason there's no issue is because it's already been planned for here. It's already planned for, no issue. So that box is checked off. Okay, good. Um, public transit. Public transit is not available at this time at this property. And the reason is because there's no, not enough population base here yet to support the cost of bringing in a bus to service the area. But that's a good sign because it's planned for already development here and for transit to come when the time is right, when there is enough population to serve those bus routes. And MUDT has commented that that time is when this whole area of Expo Parkway gets developed, then there's enough population, and then the bus routes will come. And Ken has planned on this property already a bus stop to be put in for school buses. Meanwhile, and the kiosk and when public transit comes, there will be a place to be picked up and be able to use shut transit. Transportation, that's a big one. Um, and we're going to let Bob talk more about this. So I'm going to just jump right into the bottom line, if you will. And, I, and I, I know there's a lot of sensitivity to this. And please know I'm sensitive to this. We've done a lot of housing over the years, thousands and thousands of units. Uh, and custom residential as well, all facets of residential, I understand. Um, but the bottom line is, the facts are that at full build out of this property, which is about 950 units, you can't build more than that, just that's not enough land for it. At full build out, 950 units, there will be a, a difference in delay at the traffic signal at the interchange of less than five seconds. That's four seconds you're into 950 units. It's this city, it really desperately needs housing here. It desperately needs it. That's not enough reason to, to approve an RM145 zone here, but it's a fact that we all need to really take seriously. This is a perfect place for it. It's already planned for. It's really a perfect place for multifamily. And transportation, let's just, we got to follow the facts. The facts say that less than five seconds of difference at a traffic signal to get through from this development fully built out. Schools, um, can talk to Hellgate schools, and uh, they're available to have 400 additional students at this day, and there's room for expansion. So we're able to offer people here, one of the best school districts in the state, and there's, uh, that's a really good thing to know that we have schools available to accommodate families here. Um, trails and pedestrian, that's the slide we have up here now. Pedestrian circulation, that's in place now. That was well planned. The trail system in the city is just, it's just fantastic. It goes all the way from Upper Grant Creek under the underpass uh, of the I-90 uh, freeway um, and then down uh, reserve into the center of the city and disperses throughout the city. It's all in place, so that's good. It's a checkbox as well. Um, then I haven't really said what's the right use for this land yet because that's the process we go through first. Let's go through that research first. Now, what is it that the city needs most? Go to that one, please. These are a couple of articles currently uh, recently put out by different news agencies. 
And the truth is there are zero apartments available in the city. One half a percent vacancy rate. That's not an inconvenience or a problem. That's a crisis and we need to, I'm, I'm passionate about this. It's a serious crisis and we need to address it. Where we have land available for this type of multifamily, we need to best utilize it as we possibly can. In 15 years, we need 9,000 more units of multifamily. This is a perfect place for multifamily, perfect transitional location for multifamily. Now, the next topic is a little bit sensitive. I'm gonna to try to say it anyway. I know we can't base decisions on this, but it's just true that there are reasons for opposition and I understand those reasons. Transportation is a big reason that we address, but there's other reasons. And where this location is, is uh, it's not in anybody's backyard. It's not even in anybody's front yard. It's really not even in Grant Creek. It's an Expo Parkway that fronts the freeway. And, um, and it's not impacting other areas surrounding it in an adverse way. So immediately surrounding the property, it's commercial uses. Those building heights are <clears throat> between 40 and 52 feet high. So at R145, we won't be higher than our surrounding context. To the north is a, a residential development. There's about six or seven lots that are adjacent to the north property line. Topography on that area, going from our flat area of our site to the northern boundary, there's about a 200 foot horizontal direct dimension there where the slope slopes up uh, at a minimum of 45 feet of gain at this northeast corner of our property. And as you go westward, it climbs a bit more. So at, the, at 45 feet, if we capped out at 45 feet, the residents at that area there would be looking over the top of the buildings. Their views, about the only view that we block truly would be the freeway and maybe a little sound uh, break, and that's about it. <clears throat> so suitability, is this suitable for this use? It's, I've already said it, it's, it is a perfect transitional location from high intensity commercial use um, to what's above us is medium density residential and low density residential. This is a section, by the way, that Callum pulled up for me that shows how the houses to the north will look over the top of the 45 foot uh, buildings. So it's a perfect transitional location. It is suitable for the city. It considers the character of the district based on what I just said, it's, it really is. If we went for a commercial zone in the front of the parcel, like zoning says now, well, that would be a good solution. We could get a lot of density there. We could go 110 feet tall. And then we could go lower density, you know, three, not lower density, but three stories to the north, like zoning says. We could do that. And we still have ability for open space. That's a good option. But I also don't think that's appropriate here. It's not, it's not sensitive to the, neighbor, the neighborhood. It, 110 feet, I mean, that's not right. 45 feet, RM145 guarantees that we're not impacting anybody around us at RM145. So the big question that council is, is really trying here to address is, is this rezone in the best interest is this for the city as a whole? And I mean, okay, this is my opinion. And I, I think that a lot of people have to share my opinion on this. The answer is absolutely yes, this is, the best interest for the city as a whole. We need 9,000 units in 15 years. This is a perfect location. It is going to offer opportunity for multifamily that I've never seen before with open space like Ken talked about. Amenities that I've never been able to bring into a project before. It's perfect for multifamily. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna let Cody speak a little bit about infrastructure and then, uh, then we're gonna let Bob come in remotely and talk. I'm gonna keep it pretty brief. My name is Cody Swartz with Voith Engineering. Um, civil design engineer for it. Um, we did all the design for the water and sewer system and storm drainage for the development. Um, you know, the big thing with that is that there is infrastructure in place to serve the development with water and sewer being nearby. Um, we worked with the city 
on the storm drainage design and, and made sure that it was something that wasn't gonna be negatively impacting the um, area. Um, the water line, you know, there was some water pressure issues at first when we came to the city with this project. Um, city has a plan to put a new storage tank up above prospect there for water to increase pressures. Um, as part of this project, you know, Ken was excited to get moving on it. He's worked with the city and, and he's paying for a new booster pump there that's upping the pressures of everyone's um, water pressures in the system to help fight fires um, in the area and give those proper flows for the fire hydrants. Um, he's also sharing costs with the city on a new backup generator for those pumps for the water system. So, um, you know, I can answer questions about the infrastructure after if you guys have any questions, but I think probably most important and what everyone really wants to know about is what Bob has to say with the traffic. So I'm going to pass it off to Bob Adelin here um, with Adelin Traffic Services, and, and he can dive into that a little bit more. All right, can, uh, can you guys hear me there? Yes. Great. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you there, Cody. Uh, yeah, this is Bob Ablin from Ablin Traffic Services. I put together the uh, traffic impact study for the project. Uh, traffic is always always a hot button issue, and this one has some some uh, unique uh, unique things that are going on there. So I think uh, having having a discussion here is going to be a good idea. Um, so. Yes, so far we've been through two rounds of traffic impact analysis for the project. We submitted uh, the traffic impacts, I think originally last fall uh, for the first couple of phases, like uh, Dave described, uh, we came in here this spring and, and did some more analysis based on uh, based on comments from the city. Um, and you know, I could probably present do a presentation on this for half an hour, but I'm gonna try to really boil it down uh, and then let you guys ask questions about it. Um, so the, the thing, the big question on Grant Creek Road is obviously how you know the current existing problem of trying to get south on Grant Creek Road, road out of the out of the area to, down past I-90. That is a bottleneck point, and it's it's a known problem. I was out there. You know, I spent a, a good chunk of two days in that area looking at cars, counting cars at the different intersections, uh, and pulling up information for the area. But uh, the, the results of the traffic impact study uh, were very interesting and have a lot to do with the planned MBT improvements for that uh, intersection right there at I-90. Uh, beginning, I don't know if it's actually beginning now, but it's supposed to be uh, online either this fall or in the spring, but there's a major uh, MBT project that they're going to work on right there. It's going to add uh, additional through lanes, uh, southbound through lanes going through that intersection to address the existing uh, uh, issues at that location. So let me pull up uh, just a couple tables here first and then I actually have a, a very uh, uh, informative animation that's gonna help out uh, on this to, to really visualize what we're gonna be seeing out there as this gets up. Okay, um, presume you can see my screen share there. Uh, so, so these are the, are the, the results of the traffic impact study. Uh, if you read through it, it's, you know, there's a lot more details in here, but but I wanted to pull up these couple tables because they're, they're really the, uh, the crux of the whole project. Um, the, the major concern that we have at that intersection is southbound traffic coming out from the project. Um, and I analyzed it uh, actually in, in actually even more scenarios than there are on here. Uh, but this shows uh, the existing uh, level of service, phase one, phase two, and full build. Now this is actually with the planned MDT improvements. Uh, right now, the intersection is actually, you know, it's been identified, I saw it, uh, the backup is pretty bad. It's currently running at level service D. That leg of the intersection is coming out at about F during the peak conditions, uh, you know, mostly during the morning when people are coming out from there. Uh, but once the MBT improvements come in, things change considerably. Um, once that, those MBT improvements are in place, our level of service improves to, to uh, uh, level service C uh, with 34.6 uh, seconds of uh, average delay for drivers. Uh, and that's a, a, a tremendous improvement from what's going on at, on, at that location right now. Um, but then the very interesting thing that, things that we get to pull out of the traffic impact study then is, you know, how does that change as you add phase one of the project, phase two and full build? And running, running all the numbers again, using all, everything the same, uh, with the additional traffic from the project, 
our total delay goes from 34.6 seconds of delay up to 37.3, which is a fairly small amount of change, even though there's a fairly large uh, increase in traffic uh, coming south uh, based uh, on this project. And that's, uh, you know, of course we can talk about the numbers all day long uh, and I have a bit, much better visualization here for this, but I just wanna run through the numbers just really quickly. Um, uh, you know, similar thing in the afternoon, you know, it's not as bad in the afternoon at that intersection because there's a, a little bit less demand uh, just, and just based on the uh, way the intersection operates with the signal timing, it just tends to work better in the afternoon. Uh, but at the same time, uh, with the existing uh, traffic uh, and this, you know, this is with the MET improvements, uh, we're going to go from 25.1 seconds of delay to 27.3 seconds at full bill out of the project. Uh, with, a, with a, like I said, with a fairly significant increase in volume. Um, but now let me actually go to the interesting one because this is the one that really does show what's going on. This is a simulation uh, that's, that I did uh, based on uh, a model that MBT put together. This, like, uh, this is an MBT model. They, they created it. They put the traffic volumes in, the traffic timings in, the lanes in. The only thing I did is come in and uh, add the extra information for uh, the specific project and then uh, uh, tweaked the, the lanes around uh, for the MDT improvements. Uh, so if I go to my other video here, uh, here we go. So, so this is the, the, the simulation of the existing traffic conditions as they are right now, one southbound uh, lane. Oh, we're, go still ahead. Your, uh, we're still seeing your PDF. So you might, you might need to share that other window specifically. Gotcha, okay, thank you. Uh, let's try. Mm, don't tell me this is gonna. If you stop <laughs> here and then reshare it, it'll allow you to select a different window. So if you go up to the top, there's there should be a red stop share button. Gotcha. Okay. Or I can stop it for you if that's there. You go. There we go. Stop share and reshare. Uh, should be able to go to let's try. Oh, that's interesting. My apologies, guys. I thought this one was going to come up a little easier than this. Let me try. Hang on, because this, this is a, a, a fairly important uh, thing here. Let me open this differently. So I think it's having trouble with uh, this particular program. Okay, let's try it like this. I don't know. And when you click the the green uh, share screen button at the bottom, you, you you get the different options for which window to present. Is that coming yeah, up? Yeah, but it's not. It's interestingly, it's not coming up. Oh. Or maybe, or maybe this. Uh, here we go. Let's try this. Okay. Now can you see it? Uh. Yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. Uh, okay. So so here's the simulation for uh, the, the existing traffic conditions, the existing lanes. Existing volumes, like, like I say, this is actually all the MBT uh, inputs uh, for the project. And this, uh, I'll hear before I go on, uh, it's also running at eight times speed, so you can see it a little bit quicker. Uh, obviously, cars aren't going that fast, but this is, this is eight times speed simulation. So, what we have going on here traffic queuing up from the, uh, from the north as they're stacking up. Uh, just the way this signal operates, uh, there's a lot of time between traffic signals. Uh, the, this traffic stream starts to go, but usually and when it's busy, and it, uh, there's a lot of testimony of this, when it gets busy, uh, the, the uh, traffic stream doesn't even get the clear. It, it stops, you know, with 75% uh, of the cars gone, and then it starts queuing up again. So this is this is a major problem. This is something that, that I had noticed, that MBT noticed, and that really does have to uh, get addressed. Um, you know, the tr cars try to clear, uh, it gets almost done, it stops again, uh, it cycles out. Okay, so then this animation is what it's gonna operate uh, as with the new lanes that MET is gonna be uh, constructing here at the end of the year. 
Uh, this is with the, the uh, two, through, two southbound lanes, through lanes uh, coming onto reserve and also a uh, separated right turn lane coming onto that I-90 ramp. And this is a fairly stark difference between the, the operational characteristics. Uh, generally what you're gonna see uh, is uh, that the, the cars are gonna queue up four or five deep uh, and then they're going to clear and the, the, the signal is going to move on to the next phase. Uh, the, this really does make the entire intersection work considerably better. You can see it stacks up, uh, it changes phases, it takes off again. Uh, it, under this scenario, you're, you're going to see uh, vehicles queuing up. I, I think the 95% percentile queue is about 250 feet uh, from that intersection. That's you know five, seven cars at most. Uh, and that's how much better this is going to work with those with those improvements. Uh, so then I took the exact same uh, road configuration and added all of the new traffic from the full build out of uh, the, the, the project here, uh, the, all 950 units of the, the development. And obviously, you know, that's a fairly significant increase in traffic. But I think you'll notice if you watch the video, uh, the cars start to queue up, uh, they're getting back there. Uh, to the, about the 300 foot range, and th then the signal changes, everything clears. Uh, and that's going to be the general condition, even with all the, the additional traffic going on here. Cars stack up, the, the, the signal changes, everyone clears out quite rapidly. Now, that's not to say it can't queue up a little bit. I think the maximum queue uh, that it uh, came up with, uh, the simulation came up with, was you know almost back to the intersection here, but at the same time, that's way better than what you're experiencing right now. And uh, you know, it stacks up almost to the uh, uh, Starbucks there, clears out, everybody takes off actually much faster just based on the fact that you have all the different lanes and the whole thing clears before it cycles out. So, so e even with the full build out of the project, based on the new intersection configuration, uh, the way that the numbers look is that you're never gonna sit through two cycles at, of that intersection. So from my perspective, this is a tremendous improvement in the traffic operations there, a tremendous uh, the increase in capacity, uh, and it, it really provides the opportunity to do projects like this out here uh, without uh, with actually ha having better conditions than you're dealing with right now. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's what the, the numbers are telling me. And uh, yeah, I'm sure th there's going to be more questions about traffic, but I wanted to uh, uh, share that with you guys because I think the visualization uh, is uh, is really useful in this case. Um, so there we go. Um, but yeah, but that that was most of what I wanted to present. Um, I, I'm happy to answer more uh, specific questions about traffic, but I figured that would be a good place to to start. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate that. Um, and um, so you know, we are we are. Um, out of time for the, the the applicant presentation. I don't know if there's any brief kind of uh, uh, closing remarks from from Ken and team before we um, before we move on to questions. But um, just go, you know, if you do if you do have a couple of closing remarks, please just keep them real brief. Yeah, I, would, I just want to show you guys uh, some elevations. Uh, it, it, and why why I'm doing this is we're not doing a bear. Uh, you know, we're not just getting by. This is this is a great neighborhood. We want to be a part of it, and we're putting you know money into it. Um, so I just want to show you a couple elevations on what type of buildings we're going to have, and some amenities that we're showing, uh, architecture, things like that. We have, a, we have a virtual uh, issue connecting with SEC here. We're almost pulled up. Had to reshare. Okay. Okay. So this is a this is a community center. So this is the community center. I mean, you can see the type of construction. This is not a. A very uh, minimum. This is a a, a family friendly uh, environment here that we're trying to provide. Um, we'll show an elevation of the buildings. So. Yeah, that up there more. Yeah. And here's a, a typical 
elevation of the of the buildings. Um, there's brick on there. There's steel. Uh, this is again. It's not. It's not. It's not the bare minimum. And, and we know we we know that this site deserves more, and, that, and that's what we're doing with it. So just wanted to share those with you, so you can get a visual on what will be there. Okay, thanks. So we do need to move on. Uh, what I, I've received a couple of requests for a brief recess. So what I'd like to do is, is take a really quick recess. Um, we will, it's uh, 10.04. Uh, let's try to be back at, at just in, in about three, four minutes and, and we'll get started again in a few minutes here. And, and we'll do questions uh, after that and then we'll move on to the, the other presentation.
Okay, let's uh, try to get started if, um, if folks are back. All right, I think we're going to um, go ahead and start. I, there's still a few people that are not back, but we'll expect them back shortly. Um, Heather, you've had your hand up. Um, do you have a uh, do you have a question? I do. Um, I, I didn't get my question um, answered by the developer in regards to um, their intention around building some units that are permanently affordable. And I know they may have just missed me asking that question. So I hope that they can answer that. Um, I, think anyone... I, heard, I think I heard the question. Um, could you repeat it? Sure thing. Um, so as a developer in this community, I think this is now, you've built three projects if I remember correctly. Yeah, you know, many. sorry, many more than three projects, but okay, go ahead. sorry, at least three that you mentioned. So you, I, I know you understand the importance of building housing that is also um, affordable. And, and yet what we still face is that we do not have enough that actually um, would be el that folks on the lower end of the social economic um, spectrum can afford. And we know that is pretty much paramount to um, the success of our community. Can you talk about what you plan to do as whether it's a number of units or a certain percentage that you hope to actually offer on the market that are permanently affordable? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, we are not planning on, on that. This is a market, it's anybody that can apply is able to apply, we're not gonna discriminate against anybody. Uh, as far as low income in Missoula, there are projects available, there's money available, and there's developers that do that, and, and we don't. Um, we have been in the, the Section 8 program. Um, they're batting 1,000% on problems. So we, uh, we worked with them, um, and, and, and they're on the same board. There's, there's, there's problems with that, that uh, program. And so we, we, have, we stopped uh, even accepting the vouchers. So I would I would refer those types of developments to those those developers. Um, there's there's many programs available for financing, but right now we we don't do those. We do market um, value apartments. Can, I, uh, Ken, real quick, yeah, uh, yeah. So even though this is market, these are market rate apartments. The the best thing for affordability and market rate rental rates is uh, inventory versus demand. And right now at 100, at one and a half percent vacancy rate in the city, what that means is rents go up because they can. And the way to get rents down to where it's a truly sustainable rent that you can maintain for tenants that are affordable is to have enough inventory in the city. And I hope that we can get that and in this city. We need it and this project will certainly help with that inventory to where affordability can be more sustainable than it is the most current time. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks, I've got uh, Mirta next. 
Thank you. Um, I have many questions, but I'm going to try to keep them all um, succinct. The first one is about um, the actual apartments. Could you, um, Mr. Alt, tell us what the rent range is for one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom apartments? Yeah, our, our uh, projection is based off of our last project of Brooklyn West, and we're using those numbers today. And a, a one bedroom is 900. Uh, two bedrooms start at 1095 and go up to 1200. The three bedrooms, we have not done three bedrooms in the past. Uh, so that number I would be guessing at, but it'll, it'll probably be, be 1400 to 1600. And due to, the, due to the shortage of units, single bedroom unit next door to us at Brooklyn West at Mullen Reserve went for 1300. Great, thank you. Um, I have some questions about the traffic analysis. Um, I don't know if Bob is still on the line. Hi. Um, the numbers that you collected and you showed us, um, what's the date for that? Uh, so, so the number, the traffic data that I collected, uh, let me check. Uh, that was, I think it was October last year was the traffic data that I collected for the project, I uh, have it right here. Um, uh, so, yeah, so, so the first data I collected was from October 2019. Uh, that was just mostly for Expo Parkway and Stonebridge. Um, the, the MET data was from April 2018, and that was for the interchange ramps. And that's, that's where all that information came from. So that's, it's uh, re re reasonably recent, fairly representative of what we call average traffic conditions. Um, usually, when we look about traffic design, uh, we we try to look at we don't like to look at the lowest numbers, and we don't like to look at the highest numbers. We like like to look at uh, something kind of in between, and that's a those October and April time periods are pretty pretty average for a normal use. So, would you say that that took into account, for example, um, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that we're in the middle of a pandemic. And as a resident of this area, I know that I have seen zero school buses. The traffic has decreased significantly because most people are working from home. Um, so I, I find it really hard to believe that uh, that is representative of normal conditions, um, particularly during school, um, well, school's in session and we have school buses traveling, you know, down Grand Creek Road, um, backing up traffic significantly as they pick up children. Um, and also during the winter when Snowball is in operation, the traffic is significantly increased during those months. So I, I think that, um, because of because of those two activities, I, I think that um, in my in my view, and I, I'm sure for a lot of the residents in this area, it doesn't seem that representative, uh, particularly because we're in a pandemic, and I think the traffic has decreased significantly, and and so I just wanted to make sure that um, that is accounted for in the simulation that you showed, and I wanted to know the dates of the the accounting that you did. Um, I also wanted to point out, and I'm sure you know, but I, I wanted to get your thoughts on the added lane southbound to get onto the highway um, westbound. That is supposed to be done by the end of um, October, um, but it has taken 20 years to get that project uh, going. And I know people who moved here and have kids going to college, and that's how long it's taken for them to see improvements to the current traffic issues. Um, the simulation that you showed significantly addresses that for the current uh, issues that we have. And I'm wondering if by the time we have the full build out, how that's gonna basically put us back to where we are today which we have been trying to address for 20 years. And I'm basing that, and maybe I'm not correct, but I that's why I would like your thoughts. The number of vehicles or trips right now, it's about 6,715. This is based on about 630 some 
residential units north of I-90. With the existing zoning, that could yield 4,518 trips per day. So we're talking about, about 10,000 more or less. And at the full build out for this development, that would create about 10,700 trips. So we would be doubling that. And that's what makes me think that we would be going back to where we are right now in terms of capacity for that intersection, even after the MDT improvement to that intersection. Can you clarify some of those points for me? Sure, sure. No, no, those are those are some good observations there, Mar uh, Marta. Um, so, you know, it's it's a, a uh, the, the the whole question of the capacity South Bend at the intersection is you know it, it's really interesting and, and complex question. I think if uh, when you look at the the simulation numbers, you can kind of see how how that extra the extra lanes that they're putting in are improving the flow and it's not just uh it doesn't just have to do with the you know going from one lane to, to essentially three lanes um the whole uh dynamic of that of the intersection operates uh much much more efficiently because you have a lot more options for people to get through the road um you know essentially if you're if you're coming southbound on uh on Grand Creek there, and you want to turn onto I-90, you should be able to do that almost without stopping, because there's going to be almost no opposition to that flow at all. Whereas right now, you get in there, you get into the queue of traffic, uh, you have to uh, get up to the intersection when the light turns green, and then you have to slow down, which slows down everyone behind you, and then you eventually get to make that turn onto I-90. The, the way it's going to operate with the MDT improvements is you flow onto I-90 without it ever stopping or without ever even slowing anyone else down. So, so you can um, basically with the lane improvements where the MBT is implementing out there, you're probably about tripling the capacity of that road, or probably even more than that, uh, which is why we can add, uh, you know, another what are the 4,000 trips a day onto that onto that section from this project, and only increase the uh, delay at the intersection by two seconds. Uh, now, it, it now will, could eventually it develop out there to the point where you run into some of the same problems again. You know that's you know that could be an issue in the future if if there are more developments beyond this out there. Uh, but as as things are now, the added capacity there is is your is going to take care of this development uh, quite quite handily and uh, provide additional capacity for for uh, the continued growth. Now, as far as the question of how we deal with the the, the traffic flow from the Mysteria, I mean that's that that is always a question. You know, is when you do these designs, do you design uh, it for maximum conditions? Do you design it for your average? Do you look at peak? Do you look at special occasions? Um, and that's you know that that's that's a big discussion about overall engineering of, of uh, different road segments. Um, one the thing I will definitely say in regards to the the ski area there is that uh, I mean yes it's it it does create a lot of traffic it does create traffic flows but l most of those flows are kind of in the opposite direction of what the primary flow from uh, this development will be this development you can't, traffic comes out in the morning goes back in the afternoon if you're going up to the ski area you're going in in the morning and out in the afternoon so those two traffic flows don't really conflict uh, as much. Just a quick follow up, um, Jordan. Go ahead. So, but a lot of your numbers make the assumption that people are gonna make a right hand turn and no one's gonna go up the, the creek, um, I'm sorry, up uh, Grand Creek Road, um, whether they're going to snowball or for the, use the trail. Um, many people currently don't use the trail in its entirety. So they park along the way um, further up Grand Creek Road so they can do a the northern portion of that trail. So while it's an amenity and, and you know, I, I think trails are meant for people. So more people is perfectly fine. That's what they're there for. But not everyone will use the trail from its beginning to its terminus. Um, so I, I can foresee people using 
making a left hand turn um, more so than you are predicting right now, just based on the amenities that exist in the area. Sure, and that's, this is where all this traffic stuff gets very interesting because it, it, um, when I got the original comments back from the, the, the city reviewer for the traffic impact study, they actually said that I should use less traffic turning left. And I had to actually make an argument it's like, no, there are amenities up there. There are things we need to account for. Um, and and the, you know, the city's reverse said, no, there should be less traffic. I said, no, there should be this much or possibly even more traffic. So I, I kind of agree with you, with you Martha. Um, it, you know, it was taken into account in, in the study and, um, you know, the, the level of service numbers do show that it actually still will work with you know, that amount of left turning traffic. You know, the, 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 uh, one of the things that did come out of the traffic study as well is that I mean, you might actually see some issues at uh, Expo Parkway, especially with that left turning traffic. Um, you know, it's not going to come to the point where we want to do additional improvements per se, but that could be an issue. But at the same time, these guys, if you're coming out from this, this specific project and you want to turn left, then you have a, you know, a great opportunity just to go up and use the Stonebridge, which has very little delay turning left coming out from that spot. So there's, there's at least some, some good opportunities to get out of that area uh, and turn left without using Expo uh, with this project. So I think that would actually probably work, work reasonably well. So at what point will you mitigate that impact? Not just, and I'm not just talking about the current residents of Grand Creek, but for the many people who deserve to have an expedient way in and out of your development, um, what would it take for that, that to be mitigated? Well, uh, you know, that, that becomes, becomes a question of how, uh, I, I guess the way I left it in the report was that there's probably not a lot of great mitigation we can do with this specific project, you know, as is, you know, there's a, a fairly large area um, along uh, Grant Creek there, uh, just right next to the road, next to the gas station uh, there that's currently uh, just vacant, I meaning is, is a, a park and ride area, parking area. Um, when, when that area is, when those areas continue to develop, you might end up with an extra traffic signal there, uh, just be, be based on the traffic volumes. Um, but, uh, Are you talking about the snowball lot? Um, yeah, whichever it is that that, that large uh, parking lot uh, that's north of the gas station uh, along Grand so Creek. That's private property right now. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, well, I, I agree it's private property, but it could potentially in the future become developed, uh, depending on, on the demand out there. Um, and and as, as other areas, areas get developed, we, we could start talking about extra mitigations, but there wasn't anything specifically that came out of the numbers that said uh, this project had to uh, mitigate uh, issues in that, at least to that specific location. And very, uh, my last question has to do with transit. Um, I, I think it's <laughs> the chicken or the egg um, conundrum. And I have always been under the impression that that is not anticipated for a number of reasons. First of all, Grand Creek would have to, the neighborhood would have to petition because right now it's not in the, the trans, transit district. Um, this development, even if it's full capacity, I don't think would trigger um, transit to be deployed to this area in part because this is a multi-jurisdictional area. So you would have to have MDT at some point, it has to cross Reserve Street. That has been a tremendous challenge for decades. And so at the very least, I think that we're looking at 10, 15 years of, um, you know, having single occupant vehicle um, development before we can even think about um, transit. So um, I guess that's not a question and just a statement that I, 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 don't, I don't think it's, I'm going to move us along there, right, Todd. Okay. Th I'm done. Thanks. Okay. Um, we have a list going here. We'll take questions for a little bit, and then we'll go to the other presentation. I yeah. answered the last question of Martha's that might clear some stuff up. You know, she mentioned it might take 10 to 15 years. This project is going to take probably 10 years to complete out. So we're not dropping 1,000 units in today. It's going to take time uh, in, to, to build this out. So that those timelines may go together. That might help you. Thanks. Uh, Gwen and then Stacy. 
There we go. Thanks. Um, I guess this is a question for the traffic engineer based on the traffic study, but maybe also the planner. I'm. I understand that based on the, the the video you showed us and the numbers you've run, there'd be um, a delay getting through the intersection. But I guess the the issue that I want to talk about is something that Amber brought up, which is the possibility of a wildfire. And um, I think we're living in a transitional era when we are having more and more fires in Montana. And you know, growing up here, we never had smoke every summer. Now. Sorry, my lights keep going out. Now, if we have, have a summer without smoke, it's a bonus and knock on wood, so far we haven't had any. Um, but clearly things are changing. And if you look at California, which is always a little bit ahead of the curb, they are having situations where they're having wildfires and people are dying in their cars because they can't get out. I think Paradise, California, that fire, um, there were several deaths. Malibu, it's an issue there. And I'm I'm certain it is impacting their traffic analysis and their planning efforts to start taking this into account as a best practice. And we may not yet have it codified in our world, but to me, it's just common sense that we have to look at it. And I, I look at Patty Canyon as probably the closest example I have in Missoula to Grant Creek. And it, it is very lightly populated and I don't really see that changing. Um, so I guess, did you or can you run a simulation where everybody's trying to get out of Grant Creek at once? Because I do not see any other ways of getting out or infrastructure going in to provide, to provide other egress out of Grant Creek. Um, and how do we start to look at this issue and take it into account? Because I think it's just common sense at this point, but that there very well could be a fire event up there and things could go from bad to worse. So this traffic simulation, if it was elsewhere in Missoula where people can go in all sorts of directions like rats fleeing a ship, that's fine, but this is a bottleneck. So how do we address, and I know it's it's a slight chance, but it's very extreme stakes if it happens. So how do we address that? I, I think that's a, that's a, very good question, Gwen. And uh, uh, this is actually something we did talk about a little bit as far as how, how in, in an emergency scenario, how could you clear out uh, the traffic from this development and uh, up further up the canyon as, as quickly as possible? Um, you know, obviously the uh, MBT improvements out there would tremendously play into that because you have to you know, try to clear. You know, I think it's not necessarily a question of, of how quickly uh, you can get them out, but it's more of a question of what you, can you do out there to clear cars as, as fast as you possibly can? And it's an interesting question. Uh, one of the things that we can, can uh, certainly do and we can talk about with MBT uh, is under the current scenario, the way the MBT is operating that traffic signal, they're actually giving the absolute least priority they possibly can give to traffic coming southbound on that road. But that's why right now it just doesn't work very well. They're, they're giving as little time as they possibly can to that traffic movement coming south, um, which causes the current backups and that's that's a tremendous problem. Uh, you know, with lane improvements, uh, even even still giving them, giving that leg the least amount of uh, time possible with MDT improvements, it actually is gonna work pretty good. But what we can do uh, is we can talk to MDT and say, hey, if we have an emergency scenario up there, can we activate an emergency timing uh, situation on that traffic signal that you know lets other the the other legs go, but gives the bulk of the priority to getting people out of that road? And at that point, uh, you have three lanes coming out through that intersection. Uh, if you could give them half the time, you could clear out you know four thousand cars an hour out of that area uh, uh, with uh, with half the the available signal timing uh, going south. And that should pretty much uh, get just about everybody out of there. Okay, thanks. Um, there are a number of, of additional questions. This is a complex issue. Um, in fairness for time, I'm going to um, stop our question queue. We'll come back to it. Um, the Friends of Grant Creek and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation um, have, both have uh, presentations. We're, we're, so we're going to move to those at this time, um, and then um, we'll come back. Um, you know, one thing that I am uh, 
just want to be absolutely clear about is that we will um, we will make sure that we have enough time to get questions answered. So this this may take a follow up meeting um, sometime, uh, you know, a follow up LUP meeting. Um, and um, so I, I appreciate everyone's patience. It's a complex issue, and uh, appreciate uh, uh, everyone's um, willingness to put the time in on this. So we'll 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 pivot now to that. Um, and um, uh, we have uh, Aaron Nuzo here from uh, uh, Friends of Grant Creek, um, and then. Um, We'll uh, we'll have a little bit of time at the end for additional questions and and a, a little bit of public comment. So, Aaron, take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Aaron Nuzo. I know many of you. Um, good to see all of you. Uh, I am born and raised in Missoula, and I have lived in the Cottonwood condominiums at the mouth of Grant Creek for the past five years. Uh, I am hoping to welcome our new neighbors at 2920 uh, Expo Parkway based on the existing zoning. And we are very excited that we will have those new neighbors. Uh, thank you for allowing us the time to present uh, our support for the existing development and the existing uh, zoning and our opposition to the rezone application. Uh, just to let you know, we do welcome questions throughout the presentation. Um, so I heard some questions regarding the Grant Creek watershed and the impact of this new development. Um, so we'd like to begin by providing you with a 30,000 foot view of the proposed rezone location, uh, which by the way, does not lie within the city core as uh, staff has stated. Grant Creek, uh, as most of you know, is a tributary of the Clark Fork River and ultimately impacts the health of the river. Um, on, on page 86 of the growth policy, it states, develop a river corridor plan to address and balance development, recreation, environmental considerations, and community aesthetics. Grant Creek has been designated as impaired by the Montana Department of Environmental Quality and the FWP. It's impacted by previous development downstream and reparation of Grant Creek was an integral uh, part of receiving the bill grant. And now additional funding is being sought to make that uh, area right. The Grant Creek neighborhood lies within the wildland urban interface or WUI, uh, which means wildlife and wildfires. Grant Creek is unusual in that it has only one ingress and one egress. Uh, that means there is only one way in and one way out for residents and responders during an emergency, like a gas line break, as one happened just a few weeks ago, or a wildfire. Uh, we would like to give you a quick overview of the uh, daily and seasonal population of Grant Creek north of I-90. Currently, there are 635 multi and single family residences. The existing zoning, which we support, almost doubles our current population and would provide for a mix of 502 uh, more multi and single family residences. The proposed rezone would allow for 1,195 of only multifamily units while tripling the population in Grant Creek. In addition, the I-90 North Reserve Grant Creek Road interchange serves as a gateway welcoming visitors and employees year round. In addition to the food and fuel services, we have four hotels with 374 rooms and associated vehicles. And there is room for three more hotels, two to 300 more rooms and vehicles. The Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation welcomes 60,000 guests a year, plus school buses almost every day from April through May. Up to 400 vehicles a day travel to Snowball with another 50 to 100 parking in the lower lot across from the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. So we're gonna take a look at the parcels. We would like to now show you the parcels under consideration. The image is from the Montana Cadastral. You can see the southern parcel highlighted in blue with the northern parcel uh, directly above it. The developer has repeatedly stated that the property has 44 acres, which it does. However, these two acres contain only 28 developable acres because of the steep slope to the west. The potential rezone, uh, only these 28, 28 acres could be developed and the developer states only 950 units will be built. Um, but uh, there are possible for 1,195 residential units um, 
And the southern parcel can, only, can be developed to a high density uh, just within that 35 foot height. These parcels share Expo Parkway with three existing hotels and one restaurant. Eventually, these new residents uh, will be potentially sharing Expo Parkway with six hotels. These parcels lie directly west of the Cottonwoods, where I live, um, and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, and will share Stonebridge Road. The rezone area lies directly south of Old Quarry Road, neighborhoods of modest single family homes that are one story or split level. So again, we'd like to reiterate our support for the current zoning and for this development. We would like to make it clear that we feel a shared responsibility to provide housing equitably according to Grant Creek's unique site constraints. We recognize Missoula's need for rental homes and want to provide our new neighbors with a neighborhood setting that is sustainable, complementary, and cohesive. We support smart growth concepts like mixed housing types and mixed use developments. The density of the current zoning, while almost doubling Grant Creek's population, takes into account the site and transportation limitations. 17.6 units per acre provides mid-density development called out, uh, called out for in the growth policy. Um, the existing zoning went through a rigorous public policy and enjoys strong community support. New zoning deserves the same. The Grand Creek Area Plan is a living active document and an amendment to the current growth policy, and as such should be considered when making decisions uh, regarding the zoning. We would like to ask, why can't this property be developed according to the current zoning that is supported by the growth policy as well as the neighborhood? Friends of Grant Creek, as you've heard, uh, mailed out a petition supporting development and the current zoning and opposing the rezone application. We had a 45% return with over half of those making written statements. These petitions have been submitted and are part of your meeting packet. And as you may have already seen, the neighborhood overwhelmingly supports development and the existing zoning. What we oppose is the high density rezone application. We also provided those outside Grant Creek to weigh in through I petitions and received 74 unique signatures from other neighborhoods. There has also been a formal protest peti petition process um, where 31% of the required property owners within 150 feet of the rezone area, which includes my condo, um, have signed. Uh, that's requiring a two thirds city council vote for approval. We will review the rezone application using the same review criteria we are required to use for Title 20. The city growth policy adopted in 2015 is Missoula's guiding document for growth and development. It is divided into the following categories, safety and wellness, livability, economic health, housing, community design, environmental quality, and much more than, uh, oh, excuse me. Yeah, much more than a single map. Um, Friends of Grant Creek feel that the current residential zoning is much more in line with our growth policies, goals, and objectives than the proposed rezone. Another plan applicable to this application is the Grant Creek Area Plan that was uh, developed in 1980 and is an amendment to our city growth policy. Regardless of the age of the plan, some neighborhoods are still invested in and rely on their plans for guidance and continue to work on implementation. That's on page 100, 140. And in all cases, the land use recommendations from the growth policy and associated neighborhood plans should be viewed in conjunction with the goals, objectives, and actions of the growth policy. Again, that's page 143 to 144. We will highlight a few specific growth policy goals that are not fully covered in the other review, review criteria. Okay, here's the future land use designation map. As you have seen, the future land use designation map, page 128 of 343 pages, does designate this area for high density development. However, there is not only fine text on the map itself, but also accompany explanations on page 114, explaining that these designations are approximations and must be considered in conjunction with all the other growth policy goals and site specific conditions. The recommendations from development services and housing and community development staff may take these other factors into consideration, but they do not give them any weight in comparison to this map of approximate designations. 
We would like to ask staff uh, why, uh, or excuse me, we'd like to ask staff or ask why staff weighed density more than all other factors for recommendations when the map itself and the growth policy states that all other factors must be considered as well. The argument has been made that more apartment units mean more competition or simply market saturation that will then drive rental prices down. Missoula has been adding thousands of apartment units over the past decade. Why then hasn't it proven to be true? According to the 2020 Missoula Housing Report, rental and home prices have only increased. Rent prices increased in every single category in 2019. It appears the new inventory of rental housing coming into the market have a base rental price above Missoula historic prices. That's on page 13 of that document. According to the 2020 Missoula Housing Report, there is currently a vacancy rate of 5.1% for multiplex units, like the apartments the rezoning will allow which means that Missoula actually has a good supply of this type of rental. Likely, thanks to the recent additions of newly constructed family, multifamily units, the vacancy rates did increase for all multiplex uh, rental types in 2019 with an annual vacancy rate of 5.1%, which is considered a good rental supply. Houses and duplex had a much lower vacancy rate of 2% or less. There is little new construction of homes and du duplexes for the rental market. We would like to ask why the Office of Housing and Community Development staff is recommending approvement, approval of this very type of zoning and housing we do not need and why staff is not supporting the existing zoning that does. Livability. The first growth policy category we'd like to highlight is livability. We feel the proposed rezone does not address any of these livability factors. A walkable neighborhood with clean air and water, lower the combined cost of housing and transportation. This is market rate housing requiring the use of automobiles, easy access to services and employment, not only avoid tra traffic congestion, but to provide safe, reliable transportation options, involve the community in development decisions. We would like to ask why neither city staff nor the developer engaged the community regarding such an important and impactful decision. For economic health, the city growth policy calls for workforce housing with the caveat, the housing does not require the use of automobiles. The Grand Creek neighborhood sadly is vehicle dependent. For many reasons, uh, the city growth policy focus inward concepts and development. We understand that does not mean all growth is centered around downtown. It does mean that development should center around services, amenities, employment, be near public transportation, and have multimodal transportation options, all of which Grant Creek lacks. This rezone does not support economic health as detailed in the growth policy. And we would like to ask how staff would recommend high density housing in a vehicle dependent area when many city policy and plans call for fewer vehicles on the road. Finally, specific to the growth policy is housing. We feel the rezone does not meet the requirements that the growth policy calls for other than meeting a density approximation on the future land use designation map. Both the growth policy and housing policy call for affordable rentals and homes. The rezone will provide market rate apartments only. We are affected by the rising costs of living in Missoula. The growth policy calls for housing that actually decreases residents' costs of living besides rental costs. With the rezone, commute times for everyone will be much longer. There is no public transportation and then planned into this foreseeable, excuse me, the foreseeable future. Uh, no multimodal transportation options are available. There is dependence on vehicles and it is located away from services and employment. The proposed rezone will only increase resident costs of living and does not support the growth policy. We would like to ask how the Office of Housing and Community Development can recommend approval of a rezone that would only increase residents' cost of living when the a place to call home policy specifically emphasizes the importance of affordable uh, throughout affordability throughout. The rezone is not designed to secure safety from fire and other dangers. As mentioned earlier, Grant Creek has a single ingress and egress. Tripling the population at the mouth of the canyon with one way in and only one way out put stress on emergency services. 
Grand Creek Road has minimal to no shoulder, making access and evacuation during emergencies tenuous. The developer has asked what infrastructure we were missing. We we're missing a second way out of the Grant Creek Valley. The, excuse me. Uh, the Wildland Urban Interface, or WUI, was mentioned earlier. This rezone is part of and directly impacts the residents and neighborhoods that are within WUI. Residents have been warned for years by all fire agencies that a major wildfire in Grant Creek drainage is not an if, but when. Many residents have been mediating their properties in preparation for such an event. This photo shows um, what happens during a wildfire event. In 2016, Northwestern Energy Line started a blaze and immediately Grant Creek Road was lined with onlookers, congesting the ingress for emergency vehicles and the egress for evacuating neighbors. Tripling the Grant Creek population at the mouth of the canyon will, with only one way in and one way out, will only exacerbate, exasperate, exacerbate these issues. Many Valley residents live in the county and are served by the Office of Emergency Management, Missoula Rural Fire, and the DNRC through an interlocal agreement. Or, yeah, wildfires in the WUI is very likely followed by widespread evacuation and traffic congestion, competing with emergency vehicle access. We would like to ask if these agencies were asked to review and comment, and if not, why? Shouldn't these agencies have been requested to provide an in-depth analysis and comment on likely effects of a high density rezone? The rezone does not promote public health, public safety, or general welfare. Idling vehicles will only add to Missoula's air pollution. They will also leave pollutants on the surfaces that will be washed into the creek. The impact of more than 10,000 additional vehicle round trips a day to an already congested situation will make it difficult for emergency services to reach their destination in a timely manner. Grand Creek is fortunate to have a three mile recreational trail and we welcome many more people to use it. However, there is no community public park or playground within a mile. With existing traffic, it is unsafe for pedestrians and bicyclists beyond the Grant Creek uh, Trail to access any services or amenities. And I can attest to that because I have tried riding my bike to work and almost got hit by a truck on the way there. The rezone offers no bus pullout or turnaround, already a dangerous situation with vehicles passing loading, loading buses. And all of these factors contribute to general welfare, which is not being met by the rezone. Adequate transportation and infrastructure uh, is not being provided for this rezone. Missoula already feels the effects of Grant Creek traffic congestion north of I-90 and on Reserve Street south of I-90. Our workforce, our visitors, and neighbors alike. The Montana Department of Transportation update at the Grant Creek Road I-90 I-90 interchange happening this summer is welcomed and appreciated, but was request requested over 20 years ago to meet the needs of the current population and, and the Grant Creek plan. This update will help to somewhat alleviate the tr current traffic congestion problems. However, tripling the area's population at the source of the congestion will only exacerbate the current traffic congestion problems, not to mention with an additional three hotel sites. Staff states transfer, transit can be cured with building permits. We do not feel this is true. We have heard from parents and concern, uh, parents concerned about the overcrowding at schools while staff made their recommendations without comment from the school district. The parents would like to hear directly from the school districts regarding capacity. As previously mentioned, the city of trail system is not connected for safe commuting or any non-motorized travel, and the rezone does not provide for a public community park. And once again, the developer asks what infrastructure is missing, a second way out. We believe the high density rezone will not provide adequate light and air for the surrounding development and neighbors. The rezone's four story buildings will abut tower tower over and shade the one story split level homes on old, old Quarry Road and two story Cottonwood neighbors I live in a two-story um, in the Cottonwoods and it will indeed tower over my two-story condo and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. The associated resident vehicles will certainly contribute to poor air quality. The high density rezone does not consider its effects on motorized or non-motorized transportation systems. With an additional 10,000 round trip vehicle trips a day, the rezone would exasperate traffic 
exacer exacerbate traffic congestion, affecting emergency services, visitors, workforce, and residents. The rezone application did not consider the impact of seasonal traffic flows in the area. Four hotels with 347 vehicles, Snowball with 250 to 400 vehicles, depending on how much powder they got that day, and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, 60,000 visitors a year. Non-motorized transportation was not considered as well. There is no safe travel connection and the area is not in the city core. It is actually two and a half miles from it. The only bike lane connecting the neighborhood to the services by North Reserve and most cyclists, including myself, refuse to use it because Reserve Street is the busiest and the most dangerous intersection, has the most dangerous intersections in the entire state. The long range transportation plan shows that emergency response times beyond the mouth of Grant Creek passed their four minute goal. But uh, City Fire did not comment on the additional traffic affecting response time and the city police stated that once the units are filled, there may be an increase in call volume that will then need to be addressed. We would like to ask if these agencies were made aware that when the rezone development is at capacity, there will be 10,000 additional round trip trips uh, moving through the I-90 Reserve Street Grant Creek interchange. Will the city need a new substation? To offer a clearer picture of the impact of this uh, level of density on transportation in the area, we wanna show you this slide that shows how many trips an average house household makes a day according to the 2017 National Household Travel Survey. As you can see, the number of trips from this is, lo is level of high density reason would actually surpass the number of current resident and current zoning combined trips. Again, these numbers only represent residents. We also welcome many visitors year round. I would like to bring my colleague Archie Cox uh, into the discussion to review the MDT update and traffic impact study. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is R.T. Cox. I'm a retired attorney. I've lived in a community about 40% the size of Missoula and was involved in a lot of litigation, land use planning committees. I served on the board of adjustment. I've had a lot of experience litigating with engineers. Um, when you hire an expert witness, you're, you always have to look behind the curtain. You have to look at the assumptions and the data that they relied upon. Here, uh, I, I filed with the uh, city uh, development services uh, several weeks ago, a, a critique of Mr. Abelin's report and he updated it and I filed a new critique and I've reviewed the city's contract engineer, WGM's review of his uh, updated report. He bases most of his data that goes into his computer model uh, as you know, you know, the quality of a computer model is based on the quality of the data. Uh, he based that on a 15 minute observation of traffic in October of 2019 at Expo and 15 minutes ex, uh, observation at Stonebridge. Interestingly, his observations at Stonebridge were at morning rush hour and he showed no traffic entering Stonebridge to go to the Elk Foundation or Cottonwood condos which defies common sense. Um, I don't know that you want to go and read the appendices to his report, but they reveal the data that is then input into his model. Uh, we've heard Mr. Morgan say that delay of traffic would only be five seconds. And we heard uh, Mr. Abelin talk about how the, the delays would be uh, not, you know, not very substantial. And he showed you his table four and table five that's contained in his report. And those show the delays at the intersection that we're talking about. And they show that those delays result in the level of service of D. Uh, they go from A to F, A is good, F is bad. Uh, D is not very good. But importantly, what, Mr. Abelin points out in his report is there's a 130 second cycle of the lights at this intersection. And that will not change even with these new lanes because the traffic 
the way the traffic works with the on ramps and the off ramps, that 130 seconds still has to be there. So uh, we've put up a slide here that is the MDT official slide that shows the configuration of these new lanes. And, and the new lanes are being sold as the panacea that will solve this problem. First note, there's no new northbound lanes. So the two bound, northbound lanes that come under the intersection uh, with I-90 then condense into one lane and then further up the street beyond this barrier that separates northbound and southbound is a two-way turn lane, which gets very congested because people are getting into it to turn into Starbucks or the town pump. And people are also queuing up in there to make a left turn onto Expo. None of that is going to be improved by the MDT project. There are constraints that affect remedies here. We've got hills to the uh, east. We've got hills to the west. We've got a creek that comes along here and goes into a tunnel right about here. Uh, these numbers that I wrote on the map are measurements to show distances. So the important thing is this number up here. The stop line for the existing lanes and the new lanes is here. It's 145 feet from the stop line up to here where there's actually three lanes. Beyond that, further uphill, there's still only one lane. So if we've got 130 second delay at this light, traffic is going to continue to back up. And we're gonna, if we have time, we're gonna show you a little video of how traffic backs up. So everybody that wants to go to downtown Missoula v. Orange Street or Van Buren will queue up in the left lane because there's only one left turn lane. People that wanna go straight will queue up in either of these lanes. People that want to go, turn right will have a better opportunity to do that. There's no question that this is going to improve things, but they can't get into that lane until they get to this point where the lane is actually created. And the reason the lane isn't longer is because Grant Creek is right here. Uh, Grant Creek runs along here and goes into a tunnel here. So if somebody wants to turn right, say it's a tourist coming from the town pump pulling a camper trailer, if they can get to this lane, they can turn right. Otherwise, they will be in the queue with everybody else in this single lane that routinely backs up to Expo and frequently to Stonebridge. So this, this is being marketed as a panacea. This is 145 feet from here back to here, the, where the two lanes are. You can put, if you've got a truck that's 20 feet long, you know, how many, how many trucks can you put in 145 feet, seven or eight or nine of them? If you've got a Honda Accord that's 16 feet long, uh, how many of those you may even get nine of them? So you're gonna have nine or 10 additional vehicles in queue here and here. Uh, how much is that going to improve the traffic flow when you have hundreds of cars coming out of this proposed redevelopment? Interestingly, if you look at the graphic, the sketch plan that the, the uh, developer has, it shows somewhere between 1,500 and 2,500 parking spots. So one of the things that hasn't been studied is the effect of, of, the, of flooding events. And uh, there's a, a FEMA floodplain map. If water overtops the bridge at Prospect, that's 54 feet higher than the point where Grant Creek goes into the tunnel. So that water would spread out and could affect those bridges on Expo and Stonebridge. Um, the staff, I mean, you look at some of these numbers in Mr. Abilene's table that show 0 0.8 seconds of delay or 1.1 seconds of delay for traffic getting through this intersection. That is simply not credible. And if you look at the staff's comments on the original recommendation for approval from the Metropolitan Planning Organization and from Public Works, they didn't find his results to be credible either. Uh, the little uh, animation that he presented to you was, I'm sure, fascinating. 
uh, it, it's not realistic. If you watch that, you see almost no traffic going out of Expo and no traffic going into Expo. So it's a nice computer simulation that would make us all feel good, but it's not realistic. Even Mr. Abelin's data, which I criticized in my report and was also criticized by WGM, shows over 5,000 trips per day coming out of this proposal. And remember that if you pass the rezone, there's no guarantee that the project is gonna be built as Mr. Alt is presenting it. It opens the door to any project uh, by any developer once you, once you grant that. Uh, do we have time for the movie? I don't believe we do. Um, I uh, promised equal time to the applicant and um, the Friends of Grant Creek and, and um, Mr. Parker with Rocky Mountain Health Foundation. Uh, we're, at, we're at 30 minutes so far on this presentation. So we've got, we've got 10 minutes left for both uh, the conclusion of the Friends of Grant Creek presentation as well as the Elk Foundation presentation. Great, um, I'll make this quick. Um, all right, uh, so review criteria 1G, compatible urban growth. Um, the surrounding de densities were not considered for this rezone as you can see from the slide. Uh, the rezone allows a density of 43 units per acre, and the surrounding residential densities range from 8 to 17 units per acre. The rezone density would be two and a half to five times greater than the immediate residential development and would represent 60% of residents in the valley. The current zoning is much more compatible with its neighbors at 18 units per acre. We agree that a gravel pit is ideal for the current zoning and we support that and we support it. Um, but we also want to emphasize it's much more compatible with its neighbors at 18 units per acre. The rezone application also does not consider the surrounding character and uses. The rezone only provides one type of market rate rental only housing. The surrounding development uh, uses, uses are wide range from single family to multifamily homes to commercial. Also offer our rentals and home ownership in neighborhood settings. For example, in the Cottonwood condominiums, I have many neighbors that are renters and do not own their, their, um, their property. Uh, the current zoning is in line with its surroundings and the Grant Creek area plan uh, and with the Grant Creek area plan. So we ask why can't the property be developed according to the current zoning? Uh, the rezone application did not address rezone review criteria two and three. Number two, whether the proposed zoning amendment corrects an error or inconsistency in the zoning ordinance or meets the challenge of a changing condition. And number three, whether the proposed zoning amendment is in the best interest of the city as a whole. We do not feel the rezone application meets either of these criteria. We believe we have established that the rezoning does, does not sustainably adhere to the uh, growth plan, and in particular, it does not adhere to the most important considerations, safety and livability. The SAC re recommendations promotes density at all costs. Within a seven, uh, seven to two vote to recommend denial of the rezone, the planning board made it clear that they did not agree with staff. And even though the burden of proof for rezoning is supposed to be placed with the developer and staff, it took community members to provide the proof that it does not work. Uh, we are welcoming zoning with 502 residents, which almost doubles the population and will certainly have an impact on traffic. However, it will also provide a, a variety of housing types with walkable neighborhoods and complete streets, rental units, and the opportunity for home ownership, mixed use development, and a more rigorous subdivision review process. It adheres to the Grant Creek Area Plan, an amendment to our city's growth policy, and we're asking for smart growth and for neighborhood involvement in a in a planning process for the best interest of the city and its residents. Once again, we ask why can't the parcels be developed according to the current zoning, which is supported by the growth policy and the neighborhood and provides the exact type of rental housing Missoula needs. Thank you so much. All right, um, thank you both. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, I think we'll go to um, Mr. Parker's presentation and then we'll come back to questions for the two um, uh, for the two presentations here. Okay, um, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Great. Um, my name is Grant Parker. I'm general counsel with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. It was also represented by Aaron Nielsen, who, um, who will be making a presentation following mine. I'll try to be brief. Um, I want to thank um, my city council representatives, Jordan Hess and Myrtle Becerra, who represent where I work, and Gwen Jones and Heather Harp, who represent where I live, and all the other council and committee members who have joined this. Um, Little, little background on the Elk Foundation for those of you who may not know us well, I hope you do, but um, the Elk Foundation was established in 1984 in Troy, Montana, and moved down to Missoula in 1988, where we set up in the um, old Caterpillar service and dealership facility on Broadway, <laughs> um, spent a lot of money cleaning that up, um, and then decided that we were outgrowing that and look for another place to live. <laughs> we um, looked at Fort Missoula, some of you may remember that. Um, looked at the county property out on Airport Expressway and other locations and, and then settled on, on this grant property as a good fit for us. Um, as you know, it has been discussed, we went through a rezone. Um, but when we, we came here, we relied a lot on the character of Grant Creek and our, our ability to um, use our international headquarters as a, as a way to service our members and, and accomplish our mission. The Elk Foundation now has about 2,234,000 2, members, 13,500 in Montana. Um, we have 90 employees out in Grant Creek, um, many of whom are um, social distancing and working from home at this point. Um, but um, wanted to talk about um, why we moved here and, and point out that a big factor was was the character of the Grant Creek neighborhood and we, we understand the current zoning and we support um, the current zoning we have no problem with that but um, when we moved here um, there there was a Grant Creek area plan that was developed in 1980 which is still in effect. Um, I would point out that that is an integral part of the Missoula's growth policy and it was ignored in the staff report. No, no, it was not remorse, ignored. They did make a statement, quote, however, the city growth policy supersedes the Grant Creek area plan. As Aaron pointed out, that is incorrect. It is a part of the growth policy and needs to be considered by um, Missoula in looking at any Rezones. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to point a few key points of the um, Grand Creek Area Plan and urge all of you to review it. Um, the goals and objectives include the economic and social well being and being tied to the quality of the natural environment. The rural ethic is the basic foundation for the community. Um, they talk about transportation. They said it must provide two routes into the Grant Creek Valley. As has been pointed out, that is not the case. That it um, must provide an alternative emergency right out of the valley in the event of wildfire. Again, again that has not been done. Improve the Grant Creek Road to handle increased traffic flow. Um, as R.T. Cox has pointed out, I, um, there's a little effort to do that, but adding um, uh, the um, ability to more easily get on the westbound lane is really doesn't address the traffic needs of Grant Creek. Um, wildlife, which is obviously important to the Elk Foundation. Um, protecting existing wildlife populations by establishing winter range preserves and domestic animal control provisions. Uh, Mr. Alt talked about um, how important dogs were to him um, in the neighborhood Council meeting last night, he talked about over 100 dogs in his, I believe it was the Mullen um, Road um, development. Um, um, I'm, as a dog owner, I, I fully support that. But um, as many of you will know, the Elk Foundation has worked with the city council to make sure that the walking trail here um, was able to connect up for the north. Um, we live with a lot of dogs who are off leash. We, have a huge amount of um, unpicked up dog waste and it is a um, health and safety issue. Um, and I, we think that adding how many ever other, other pets in there will, would have a big impact on our property and on the wildlife in the area. Um, something that has not been addressed 
in the staff review or the applicant's discussion. Um, <coughs> a few other things from the Grant Creek area plan, establish air quality control monitoring with the Grant Creek Valley. And it's interesting that they have economic goals that provide commercial public service centers within each neighborhood, encourage employment one of residences within neighborhood commercial and public service centers and encouraging local employment opportunities compatible with residential land uses in each neighborhood to minimize commuting requirements. <coughs> um, um, I'm gonna to briefly touch on a couple of um, health and safety concerns that the Oak Foundation has. Um, um, there's been some discussion of Stonebridge Road and um, must point out that in the event of a flood or a wildfire, um, there's gonna be real problems moving people in and out of Stonebridge Road. I um, have seen many times when that road has been icy and um, vehicles will skid out of Stonebridge and onto Grant Creek Road um, with the additional traffic by about 600 units. Um, that's gonna be tremendously exacerbated. The impact on the health and safety of the Elk Foundation employees and our visitors, um, including all the school buses and the kids who come here and enjoy the trail and the Elk Foundation property has not been addressed and should be. Um, uh, and one, one thing that I, I will um, make a point on and then, then turn this over to Aaron, but um, in, in the discussion earlier today, um, the, um, Dave DeGramprey made the comment that in my view, RMEF wouldn't be impacted by the zoning change. Um, I find that shocking. I disagree with it to have an additional 600 units placed on 28 acres immediately adjacent to the Elk Foundation, I believe will have a significant impact on the Elk Foundation. And I think the city of Missoula owes um, the neighbors of this proposed um, rezone um, an honest look at how it will impact the neighbors and the um, and the community that is is in existence at this point. Um, Aaron, I'll turn it over to you and be happy to answer questions um, at the end of this. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Aaron Nielsen. I work at the law firm of Christian Sampson and Basket. A lot has been said in the last public meeting and in this one, and so for the sake of everybody's sanity and time. I'm not going to reiterate it all. Um, a couple points though. Um, the zoning code is pretty clear in section 20.85.030. The burden is on the applicant to show that an application complies with all, not some, of the review criteria. And here, uh, I don't think they've done that. It's one where the burden isn't on the public to show that it hasn't been met. The burden is on them, and I think that's an important thing to note. Um, Black, um, the Elk Foundation filed a protest petition, and it's in the agenda packet for this meeting. Towards the end, it, it's page uh, 757 is where it starts. So if you haven't seen that, you might start there and just see what the Elk Foundation's position is. Um, wanted to, to touch on some of the review criteria to get back at that burden of proof point. The first here is whether or not the zoning is in uh, accordance with the growth policy. And we hear a lot about, you know, the practical point of density is important in the need for housing. And it is, um, but density isn't the end all and be all of this analysis. Um, this isn't the one and only potential development in this community where maximum density of 43 units per acre is doable. Um, for example, there's over 2000 acres in the Mullen area master plan that's a lot of attention is being spent right now. And there's other areas uh, that will be up for consideration soon. Um, one of the goals too in the growth policy is to ensure the security of Missoulians with a well-prepared and responsive emergency and disaster plan. As many people noted here today, there's a lot of concerns, whether it be fire danger, traffic danger, flood danger, um, I don't think there's been enough evidence or proof on the record to really substantiate the applicant's burden of proof with that. Um, we're asked to kind of just trust based on, you know, that video that we saw today that everything will be fine and, you know, a five second delay in traffic will, will do the trick. And, you know, I have grown up in Missoula my whole life. 
Um, I've been up in that area a lot. I think the average person will know that practically a five second delay, whether it comes from a traffic engineer or not, just isn't realistic. Um, more practically, the development here, and I commend them for this, it's a multi-use development. So, you know, a lot of families could be there, but on the other hand, what is the danger to those families and kids who are trying to cruise around on the trail with their bikes and, you know, 2,500 parking spaces there, there, there's a significant danger there. And the Elk Foundation, I mean, it gets 60,000 plus visitors, a lot of schools that go to its headquarters. Um, imagine the risk there to not only their employees and visitors, but there's, there's some danger that I think needs to be considered. Um, and also, I'm going to ask that you just uh, wrap it up as quickly as possible. We're, we're uh, very short on time here. Yep, I will. It'll just be a couple minutes. Um, you know, what if there is, in the event of a, a likely fire at some point in the near future, a car accident or a breakdown in the vehicle and it bottlenecks, is there truly an emergency plan? Like, how, how will emergency responders get in there? Can they get in there? What is the danger to not only the people in this development and further south, but even further north? Uh, and just kind of commenting that, well, it might be addressed later. Respectfully, I don't think does the community good enough, and I don't think it's good enough to comply with the growth policy, nor the 1980 Grant Creek plan, which says there has to be two routes in and, on, and an alternative emergency route, which, which isn't done here. Um, we didn't address this in our petition. Schooling, um, maybe it's fine. I haven't, I haven't looked at the facts of this, but with, with the 2,000 plus acres that are going to be developed out in the Mullen area, can that Hellgate Elementary service not only this development, but all of that out there? I don't know. Um, and I think with that, uh, one other thing is conservation of building values. Uh, the Elk Foundation is concerned with all the that's been discussed here and the risk to its employees and its operations, um, what it would mean to the value of its business, the ability for it to operate there. And kind of if, if it is as big of an impact that we think it can be, um, what that means for where they stay or stay in Missoula or look elsewhere. And so I think this is a big, big deal. It's a big deal for the community. Uh, I think it has good potential under the existing zoning, but I don't think uh, maximizing density at 43 units per acre, uh, especially under this, these facts satisfies the applicant's burden of proof. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nielsen. I appreciate that. Um, so we are um, officially out of time. Um, with your indulgence, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a couple more minutes um, to wrap this meeting up. Um, we have a hard stop um, at 1130 so that we can get the technology turned around for our next, um, our next committee meeting. What I am going to do is schedule, I'm going to touch briefly on the schedule. So we have a public hearing that starts on August 24th. That's next Monday. Um, our public hearings, as you all know, are, are multi-week affairs right now because of, um, because of our virtual meeting environment. Um, so as um, has been communicated previously, uh, the public hearing runs uh, because of the, the council schedule with, with the fifth Monday and, um, and the um, Labor Day holiday, um, the, the, the public hearing runs from August 24th. Uh, it closes on September 14th. Um, there will be opportunity to comment uh, during the live meeting um, on August 24th, um, as well as um, through the other channels. We really encourage comments on engagemozilla.com um, and also by voicemail 406-552-6012. Um, those are both great ways to, to reach us. Um, I'm going to open it for public comment and I'm going to ask that anyone, I'm going to prioritize anyone who hasn't already commented. So that includes the planning board or the neighborhood council meeting. Both of those, all of those comments are, um, are already in the public record and will be entered at, you know, into this public record. So you know, obviously not your only opportunity to comment, um, but uh, I just wanna give a quick opportunity to hear from anyone new. Um, so uh, anyone on the, on the line that hasn't provided comment, feel free to raise your hand. Okay, um, uh, Ms. Ellingson. And, um, and you may need to unmute yourself uh, and I ask you to uh, keep it to three minutes or less, please. I will, thank you. My name is Maynan Ellingson. I am a 53 year resident of Grant, of Missoula and a 47 year resident of Grant Creek. Um, I am not a 
taxpaying citizen of the city of Missoula for more, but for more than 43 years, I've worked with or for the city of Missoula and I couldn't love it any more than I do or be more invested in it. And for that reason, I offer these comments. I urge you to retain the existing zoning. I think other speakers have made a very good argument as to why this request for the rezoning does not comply with uh, the growth plan. But there are two, three other points that I would very briefly like for you to consider. One was already mentioned to some extent and that is the failure of this entire process to even mention or comply with the Grant Creek area plan. The point that's most important are the, the need for an additional exit or entrance to Grant Creek Road or out of the valley, I should say. I do not see how the city can continue to kick this can down the road. It was 40 years ago that this was mentioned and adopted by the city as a priority for this area. The plan specifically says in order to provide for the development of Grant Creek, it must, we must consider providing two routes into the Grant Creek Valley and an alternative emergency route out. That is going to cost money. There is no question about it. And who should the burden of that fall on? In my experience, it has to either be on the city taxpayers as a whole or the developer of the project or a combination of both. There is no way in a rezoning process the city can exact from the developer any cost of mitigating this kind of an improvement that is needed. If the developer proceeds with the development of the property as currently zoned, the city would have an opportunity through the subdivision review process to address this 40 year old issue in some way. Secondly, I am uh, amazed that the growth plan or the new housing plan does not in any way address the loss of the potential of 158 single family units. I don't know where else in Missoula you can have an opportunity to develop 158 units without taking um, agricultural land. The, the housing plan identifies um, affordable home ownership as one of the greatest needs and the Department of Housing and Development simply just, to my way of thinking, totally wrote that off. With respect to the issue of subdivision, the developer, both Mr. Alt and Mr. Morgan seem to suggest that because it takes a year to go through subdivision review, we don't have time. We don't have time to adequately plan this development. But by their very own admission, it's going to take 10 years to build out this project under the rezoning as requested. In addition, they are already proceeding with the development of multifamily housing on the lower parcel. So it, that is a fault that Excuse I'd ask you to wrap it up pretty quickly here. You're at about four minutes. Go ahead. Well, I just simply would encourage the city to take their time. It is, there are many other housing projects yeah. online. The 5% vacancy rate in multifamily is real. And there is a need for single family entry housing and you can better preserve that by retaining the existing zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for your comments. Um, I uh, will take one more public comment from someone who has not yet submitted comment. Um, if there's anyone on the line, uh, uh, and again, there'll be plenty of other opportunities. Okay, um, seeing none at this time, um, I 
Um, there's two council hands up. Uh, quick uh, clarifying questions on process is about all we have time for. Um, Heather and then Amber. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, Jordan, I want to pre uh, first off say thank you for um, expanding this conversation around development. We know every development project that comes before our body is extremely contentious. And it seems like every one of them has been an up zone and we have a lot of neighbors that are upset about it and they protest. So having this venue for a couple of presentations from those groups, I think is certainly worthwhile. Compliment that I, I ask, is there gonna be a presentation at the next meeting of an alliance of the future residents that would be going into these um, units? Does I, such I, exist? I, I don't have an... I don't have an answer for you. Um, I'm going to um, work with staff um, to, to make sure our next meeting is as well structured as it can be. Um, Thank you. Amber. Amber. I don't need the answers to these questions today. I know we're on a tight timeline, but I want to throw them out there as things that I would like to get answered at some point. Um, I'm curious why the MDT gives the lowest priority to the southbound lane. I'm assuming that that's because they're worried about traffic backing up onto the highway. So I'd like to know a little more about that. Um, and as far as um, someone, I think Aaron um, Nuzo um, mentioned six hotels going in uh, into that area. I would like to know about the other subdivisions being, you know, somewhat new to council still. I don't, I'm not familiar with what all the subdivisions and hotels and things that we already have planned that are coming along. I do not need those answers right now, but there'll be things out I will be asking at the city, at the uh, at the public hearing. Okay, and let's hold any substantive questions. If you can get them to us in writing uh, before the um, the public hearing, that would be great. Um, we are out of time. Again, I, I apologize for running out of time. Um, sometimes three hours seems like a lot of time, and it and then it just uh, it just flies by. So um, we'll make sure that we get enough time to get um, the rest of these issues answered. Um, thank you to the applicant and the applicant's team, and um, thank you to our uh, presenters from Grant Creek um, and to, to everyone for um, starting a very good conversation. And I look forward to the next steps. Um, we're going to adjourn now, and um, we LUP will be uh, back in session for a host of other issues this afternoon. Thanks, everyone. We'll be adjourned. <laughs>